where them gone? Some man and woman, them dead and them gone. Some boo hooligan, some damn gilligan, them dead and them gone. Where them gone? Where them gone? Them party gone gone. Where them gone? Them empty gone gone. Where them gone? I am a rasta man, alone I stand, alone I stand. But it's like one more hooligan stepping on. We're sensing in your heart. It's like one more Bobby Rang cutting down. We go to Kaya. It's like one more Gilligan running on. We marijuana. It's like one more Marty Lang cutting down. We go to Kaya. Man, we never really have time to get vexed. Wicked man never sleep on the good can rest. They brainwash man, we wear a bulletproof vest. Like them never have got a thing on them chest. And everywhere I turn, I wonder what happened next. All over human rights and them get me perplexed. All we want cool and relax and flex. And all Babylon want invade me nest. It's like... Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit, and I am Dave. And before we get into the show, I just want to say that this week's episode of Dopey is brought to you by Aloe Recovery, located in sunny Southern California in Silver Lake and Malibu. Aloe is an amazing rehab that helps people get better. Uh, Their motto is connection, not control, and they guarantee their clients will have the highest quality, most unique, and powerful healing experience that they could find anywhere. Excellent matters. They provide high-quality care, but that's not what makes them special. It's authenticity and genuineness that gives them the ability to reach the unreachable, and you can't fake that. That's what they wrote me. But when I talk to uh, Bob Forrest and uh, Evan Haynes about their program, they said something that was really sincere and really cool, and they said that they didn't like how other treatment centers had treated them when they were in treatment, and they wanted to create a place that treated addicts with respect. I have a friend who's there, and he uh, he confirms that they treat him with respect. So if you're fucked and you need help, I would go to Aloe. And if that didn't convince you, just know that their amenities are off the hook. Surfing, horseback riding, sweat lodge, sound bath meditation. It goes on and on and on. And most importantly, if you're super, super strung out, they promise you as comfortable a detox as they could possibly promise anybody. So that's Aloe Recovery. Check it out in sunny Southern California. This podcast, Dopey, is also brought to you by our friends, and bear with me on the ads. It's very exciting that we finally have ads, so just fucking sit tight. This ad is brought to you by Just Coffee Co-op. Um, their tagline is Justice from the Grounds Up. They make delicious coffee, and uh, and their thing is that they do fair trade coffee where they do not rip off growers. And uh, they support human dignity and environmental sustainability. But what's really important is that their coffee is good. I enjoy the dark roast, and it's called the Revolution Roast. Uh, Linda loves the Humdinger Light Roast, and everybody loves the Ariba Medium Roast. So uh, if you want to support Dopey, go to Just Coffee and enter in the coupon code DOPEYPOD at checkout. And that would be supporting Dopey. It would be supporting some fair trade coffee and it would be doing uh the right thing as far as i can tell and you should write them that they they were going to put out a dopey brand coffee i know you guys want dopey brand coffee so that's uh that is just coffee just coffee.com and the coupon code is dopey pod so go there and buy some coffee anyway this is a very 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 um it's going to be a very long episode. It's going to be a very emotional episode. Uh, it's Todd's birthday this week, and if you guys don't know, Todd was one of my best friends. Um, I've known him since I was uh, probably 18 or 19 years old. I met him at Ithaca College um, in 1992, and uh, and we used drugs basically until I got clean, and he kept using until he died. And this episode is going to be a long fucking episode and we're going to hear from a bunch of people we're going to hear from his sister 
um, who obviously knew him his whole life, and she is not an addict. We're going to hear from his buddy, Rob, who he was very close with, who was also not an addict, but saw you know, the depths of his addiction, and, and his sister, Allie, also saw that, and she saw the way... Um, Todd's addiction affected their family and how his death affected their family. And, um, and then Rob talks about, uh, being his friend and losing him. And then finally we hear from, uh, one of my best friends, one of my old friends, this guy named Dave, who I used to hang out with, uh, Todd and get high and we share a bunch of memories. So we start off from the family side of Dopey and we end up in the serious Dopey side of Dopey. It's going to be a very long one, so sit back, uh, relax, and the only thing I really regret is that um, is obviously that Todd can't be in this episode. So if you want to hear Todd himself, uh, Todd is available to be heard on Dopey's episodes 27, uh, which is probably my favorite episode of Dopey ever, where Todd calls in and he doesn't know he's on the show. Uh, 54, 84, 106, 115, and his final appearance uh, in 126. And we have this uh, information thanks to Just Coffee. Uh, no, we have this information thanks to uh, Cormac on Reddit. So if you're going to go on Reddit, uh, follow Dopey. Thank you, Cormac, for hooking that up. Again, if you want to hear Todd, which I totally recommend because he was a gem, episode 27, 54, 84, 106, 115, and 126 are Dopey episodes featuring Todd. So uh, let's just get get this thing underway. And our Todd shot episode is going to start with uh, his sister, Allie, and I recorded this the other day. Uh, using some new technology, so check it out. Here is Allie. So welcome to the show, Allie. Hi, Dave. That's, how would you think about the intro for for this? Perfect. I think that was that was a good that was a good intro. So, and, and you need to know this, and and the Dopey Nation should know this that for the first time ever, we are utilizing really advanced technology in making uh, the show, which is an app called Tape a Call. Uh, do you know about Tape Call? I do not. Well, Tape Call is not sponsoring the show. I had to pay them thirty dollars for the year, but people have been complaining that the 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 phone calls don't sound that good. So we're trying Tape Call instead of the phone calls. You know what I'm saying? Get your, yeah, and then get your money back if it's not good. Oh, if it's not good, we're really fucked because with Rob. You know, later in the show, you guys are going to hear uh, a conversation I had with a very close friend of Todd's named Rob. Um, but with Rob, I kind of hedged my bets, and I did him on speaker, and I recorded it on the, the normal dopey recording system as well. So this is a huge okay. risk because I'm, I'm recording you with the little earbuds because okay. I think the sound is going to be better. If you're interested in this kind of technical stuff, I don't know. Are you? Totally. Um, you are? Sure. Yeah, Totally. And out of 10, out of 1 to 10, how much of a Dopey fan would you say you are? Okay, so, I mean, like, I'm a new Dopey fan. So, I mean, I'm definitely, like, up there, like a, you know, like an 8 to 10. I, I need to commit myself a little bit I, more. I, I'd give you more of the 5, 6 range, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm comfortable with that. I'm totally comfortable with that. And have you I mean, heard any, have you heard any of the Todd episodes? I have. You know... It was like, it was kind of like a secret podcast. Like, Todd never really told me the name of it because I think he didn't want me to listen to it. So, what did he say? What did he say? He'd be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to go and like help Dave out with this podcast. And I'd be like, okay, like, well, what's the name of it? Well, you know, we're working on it. But I mean, you were already like years in, I think. (laughs) He would say we're working on the name of it. Yeah, like you were working on all of it, but no, well, the, it was already there. The funny thing about Todd and Dopey is that when uh, when Chris and I started Dopey, it was just very, very obvious to me that for me, the show was like basically about Todd um, because I had used drugs with Todd more than anybody, and uh, and Todd had the exact same sense of humor that Chris and I did for the most part. 
with right. uh, with these tragic, terrible drug stories. Although me and Todd had gotten into a bunch of situations that I thought were just the funniest thing ever, and he wouldn't want to talk about it ever again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, I mean, I I think there was like a time when I actually didn't even like let the two of you like around each other. Like when you came cross country and you showed up at my parents' house, I think I like immediately got rid of you. Well, that was that was insanity. I I came home. To, why don't you tell the story? Remember I mean, that story? I I don't remember like all of it, but I remember you guys were driving cross country. I think you got in trouble like. The entire way, like I, I like every other day. I think Todd was calling me and asking me for money for, for something. Yeah, so, we. I think we got. I think we got busted four times on that trip. Yeah, and then and I and my parents were away. Cause my parents were always away whenever Todd got into trouble. Like every time my parents went away, I was like always waiting for that phone call from you know. God. And then I, I remember you guys like just got back, and I was like, "All right, time for Dave to go." <laughs> well, no, because I, I, because Todd, I had told Todd that I couldn't come, and let, I mean, I don't even know how it got arranged, but I had told Todd I needed money from him in order to get a train from upstate back to the city. Right. And when yeah. and when I got and when I got to your house, he was like, "I don't have any money," and I was like, "Well." How am I going to get? I, and I went crazy because I didn't yeah. know how I was going to get home, and he didn't care, you know. So like I went, I went insane, and yeah. uh, and uh, and I remember I think we left a message on your phone where we were just screaming at each other, and uh, and the same thing happened with my parents, but you wound up showing up and giving me I think it was like forty five dollars <laughs> to get a bus or a train home. Yeah, to get the train home. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Anyway, so um. So, yeah, so, I mean, like, I think the show, the origin of the show had a ton to do with Todd, and I know that when we were making the show, I only wanted uh, Todd to come on the show, and when he did, like, um, I got great satisfaction out of it, because I loved your brother, and I, and I loved the stupid shit that we did together, and yeah. um, and just laughing about stuff. But um, you obviously knew your brother a lot longer than I did, Um mm-hmm. When do you think you first started seeing uh, that nature in him, the addict nature? I mean, I definitely think that, um, I mean, I don't really know exactly when it really all started, but I would say by the time he was in high school, I mean, I think he was definitely like smoking pot or um, hash or I don't know, whatever people did you know, back in the 90s, but I think, I think it was he's more like... Pot and, I think he's smoked like pot and hash. Yeah, and then I, I think and college... And resin. Todd was a right. big resin smoker. Anyway, continue. I mean, he was always like a cigarette smoker, and then I think in college... I think college was when he first got into trouble for drugs. I think it was um, like his roommate turned him in for having like... Um, 199 hits of acid. Yeah, acid in his freezer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was when I think I really started to see, you know, so I was, I mean, I was four years younger than Todd. So I was probably like 14, 14 to 16 when, you know, things really, when, you know, it was, but I don't think anyone ever really thought he had a problem until, I don't know. I mean, I think there were like some good times and some bad and then worse. You know, but I would definitely say, like, probably when I was, like, 14 or 15, he, you know, started doing stuff, and I never touched anything. And when did it, when did you start to see, like, him not be able to handle it? I guess that's, when as soon as you saw that he was using, you kind of could see that he was not handling it, because he wouldn't, you wouldn't have known that he was using if he was handling it, probably. Yeah, I mean... I think he helped, you know, I don't remember, like, his his years of living in L.A. where he actually, like, had a job, and it was, like, a good job for a while. I mean, I think he had a job. Um, I, I mean, I think he was, like, okay then. And then after, you know, like, a relationship 
broke up. I think that's when I really noticed that he really started to go bad. Was that for one of those relationships? Yeah, like one of his relationships in California. Right. Right? I mean, I feel like that's when it kind of started to really... No, I mean, I mean, I think he had he had developed a, a heroin habit in Manhattan uh, before he ever went to California, and then he left yeah. Manhattan and a coke habit too. He was he yeah. loved coke in the beginning, and then he loved heroin, and then he moved yeah. to Los Angeles and he hooked up with that woman Johanna, right? Um, and then she, when she she broke up with him, it wrecked him. But he was already a total drug addict. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, they would they took a ton of drugs together, and every. I mean, Todd was Todd was a, a total drug addict. Um, uh, I mean, before I think he ever took a really addictive substance, he was a, a total drug addict. Yeah. Because that's just how he yeah. was. Right. Um, and yeah. uh, and when do you think uh, it, it, when do you think it started to impact your family? I mean, I definitely think it impacted my family from the first time he got into trouble in college. I mean, it was really? like he got kicked out of college. He got into trouble. You know, he needed a lawyer to get out of trouble. He maybe like 20, I want to say. Like he was maybe there for not even maybe, maybe a year. Um, and then, you know, and then it was like, well, what do we do with him? It was, it was always, um, it was always stressful. Like it was, you know, I feel like it was an always stressful situation. Like, you know, what to do, how to help, you know. How would he act uh, in those situations? Like, he didn't care. So it wasn't stressful for him? No, it, it wasn't it, stressful for him at all. No, right. like, he would always be like, it's all good, it's all good, you know. It's all fine. Right. You know, I love he was just, he was always just so laid back about everything, which I think is what always, you know, drove my parents crazy because my mother is not laid back. So. And did it drive but, you crazy, that whole thing? Or you didn't know that the impact it was what was going on? No, I mean, I think I was like too young. I, I mean, I think like, I mean, his, like, you know, whatever he was doing I kind of just thought like he's a boy he's young it's just like a phase maybe you know I don't know I mean he was like in his 20s like that's when you know people boys will be boys kind of thing boys, right? yeah like boys are stupid like you know um but I don't know I would say like it I would say it really kind of started to like really affect me when I was maybe like mid twenties and he was like 30 because it was like, he really wasn't there. Like he was there, but he wasn't there, you know? Explain. Like he had a brother and, and he was in our family, but he never showed like to anything. Like he never, you know, came to, he was like avoid for holidays and he would like avoid all of us because I think he was trying to hide what he was doing mostly. Right. Or he you wanted know? to stay high and he didn't want to deal with it. Right. Well, yeah. You know, and you guys, I mean, and, and like, when did you really start to, so you, you would say when you were in your, you know, early twenties and he was in his early, mm -hmm. how old, how much older is Tom than you? Four years. So he, when he was in his early thirties and you were in your mid twenties is when, is mm -hmm. when you really started to notice it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and like, what did you see exactly? And like, and how would he behave? He wouldn't show up, you know? Yeah. Like he wouldn't show up and, you know, but it was like, it was much more than like, I think, you know, it was much more than like, just dr like drug, like addict, like Todd was like, an addict in like every sense of the word. It was like if he had, you know, a cigarette, he had like two packs a day. Or if he had a coffee, he had like eight or like a Pepsi. You know what I mean? It was like he did everything in like just such quantities. Like, yeah. 
you know, and I mean, he, he was always so skinny. He always had like, you know, he was the skinny, had a great metabolism and like, I mean, like the things that he could eat, like, can just still be so skinny. Like, you know, it was just, but that was just him. Like he would just, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, no, I know what you're talking about. He did whatever he wanted and there was no, and for a long there time, no there were no effects. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, Until um, they were things like the arrest. You know, so when, right. when did you really start to see? I mean, and I think the more consequences Todd had, it was the more he was slipping into total oblivion. Because Todd, mm-hmm. like, he lived to get away with shit. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, that was his favorite thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, like, yeah. And as, like, for me, like, as a person who never did anything, like, I never even smoked pot. Like, I remember I would have to, like, call you and be like, okay, this is what he's, like, like, what's going on, you know? I mean, it was, um, yeah, I mean, I would say, like, then once I was close to being almost, like, 30, then I was in my, like, serious, like, freak-out mode of Todd, like, um, you know, constantly trying to figure out, like, how to help him, what to do, um, you know, didn't want to ever, like, break his trust of, like, him telling me things, but when I started to think it was something, like, dangerous, then I would kind of have to, like, intervene, you know, and say, like, okay, I think it's time for you to go and, like, get help or something like that, you know? Well, do you remember the first time you kind of felt like it was dangerous? Um, yes, it was after I picked him up from rehab. So, um, it was, oh God, I don't even know. Like probably like eight or nine years ago. Um, I picked him up from rehab and my parents were away and I picked him up with my son who was probably like, I don't know, 10 months old at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, me and my husband and my son stayed with Todd at my parents' house because we didn't want him to be alone when he came home from rehab. And I, I think it was like Christmas Eve. Um, and then I think it was like that night or like the next, I think it was the next day after rehab. Um, they kept on hearing these like loud, like banging noises or something in like the bedroom and the door was locked. And, like, we kept on trying to get in, and she wasn't answering the door. And, like, it literally sounded like someone was being thrown on, like, the floor. Or, like, I can't describe it. It sounded like some loud animal was, like, taking someone down, pretty much. Um, What was it? It was Todd. But I don't know, like, I still to this day don't know what he was doing in the room. Like, I have... No idea. <laughs> right. Like, no idea. And, like, I even, like, the next day, I was like... And then the next day, he, um... The next day, he was throwing up everywhere. And he was like, oh, I got the stomach bug. And, um... Right. And, you know, my husband was like... He relapsed. Like, we need to leave. Because our rule was always, like, you can't do drugs around, like, my kids. Like... That was, you can't be high around them or be drugs around them. So, um, so like, you know, we left him alone for like a few days and, you know, and then he wouldn't admit to like relapsing until probably like a week later when he finally was like, okay, you know, I relapsed, you know, it's like he finally came clean. But that was when I really started to worry. I think I even called you and I was like, I think he relapsed, and you're like, it's normal, you know. He just got out of rehab, but I was really. Well, it's funny. It's funny because my my relationship with Todd, you know, for a long time was him comparing himself to me um, that I was the bad one, you know what yeah. I mean, and that he wasn't as bad as me, mm-hmm. and um, and he used that all the time for years. He used that, yeah. you know, and. Um, and then when that flipped, I think that got him uh, very perturbed 
And uh, he, st- he never really could make sense of it because Todd used in such a weird way. He didn't use uh, mm-hmm. drugs the way I used them. And he used them in this weird way where he would use a little bit at a time and not really get a habit, keep a habit at bay as long as he could, mm-hmm. you know. And, like, pretend that he didn't have a problem, and it was this weird sort of denial mm-hmm. thing he would do. Yeah, um, totally. And, and how did your yeah. family uh, deal with him? Like, what was it like around him, and, you know, when he was in full-blown addiction? Like, like, how did your family contend with it? I mean, it was always like there was some big elephant in the room, and I was the only one not in denial. Like, my parents were in denial. He was in denial. And I was kind of like the only one sitting kind of in the middle, like, why does no one see what's going on here? Right. The sky is falling. Why don't you see it? And they're just like, yeah. oh, pass the waffles, whatever. But, like, you know, like, Todd was charming, and he was manipulative. And um, he was very close with my mom. And he was, you know, Todd was like her affectionate child. Like, you know, he... He, you know, she, she wanted to believe everything he always said. So and she did. And she did. Yeah. And she didn't want to think that that could be happening to her son. You know. Right. Yeah. And like the biggest Todd's problem was like he never, like he never burdened his friends or I feel like us with how much he was like really struggling. You know. It was a very, like, secretive little thing that was going on. I mean, I could tell he would, he would, you know, be unhappy and, um, or, you know, sometimes he would say, like, I'm not doing well, you know, I'm not good, but I don't know. He always would kind of say, like, don't worry, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing something, I'm figuring it out, you know, whatever, but... Well, he was impossible for him to say uh, that he was miserable. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? For whatever reason, like, he never could express his, his unhappiness in general. You know, forget about, like, his drug problem. You know, he was embarrassed of his drug problem. But I think he was equally embarrassed of his misery. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, he didn't he didn't want to burden anybody because he didn't think that was, like, the way somebody right. who was cool lived. Right. And, and Todd loved being cool. You know? Totally. Not, he like to keep a job, like, you know, it was always someone's fault while why he like would get fired or you know. I mean, you know who I was trying to get on the show? I was trying to get uh Dog the Bounty Hunter's wife on the show. Oh my God. I don't was- I don't think I don't think Todd ever told the story on Dopey, but like there are so many Dog the Bounty Hunter stories with Todd and uh, and and what a surreal thing, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that he was like, the, what? Do you know anything about that job he had? I I don't remember anything about it except just some like real crazy I shit mean, about it. I feel like he got drugs for them. I don't. I'm like I don't really even know what he did for them. He told me he would like wash their cars and roll them joints and stuff. Yeah. Um, and he was like yeah. their house boy, basically. Pretty you know? much. Yeah. And yeah. then, like, and then, uh, I remember he called into Dopey once, and, uh, and he was actually, it was long after the dog, the bounty hunter job, but, uh, he was a waiter someplace, and he called into Dopey, and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm working right now, but I can talk for five minutes, you know? I think he was on the phone for like 25 minutes oh with God. us while he was waiting tables. Probably. And, um, and then he was like, I can't believe this manager fucking fired me. He, he, the Todd was just so, Todd was like, he was like a fucking movie. He would be like, the manager thought I was smoking cigarettes. And I would be like, well, were you smoking? And Todd would be like, yeah, but he didn't know that. <laughs> you know, it was just like, right. you know. Yeah, you know. like he always thought he was fooling everyone. Like no one knew, you know, I what know. he was doing. I know. Or like yeah. the other classic thing, he was a, an assistant editor for this television production company, and um, I went to see him, and uh, and he's like, I can't believe they don't think I'm doing a good job, and I was like, What do you mean? And he goes, 
goes, well, I get everything done in the first hour, and then I, like, look at page six and TMZ, and they're like, what the fuck? Why aren't you working? And he's like, I can't help it if I'm so efficient I get everything done in the first hour, you know. Which, yes, uh, I, told you, I remember that job, yes. You know, I love that line. I can't help right. it if I'm so efficient that I get everything done in the first right, hour. Right, of course. And Todd is, Todd's not efficient. No, that is not a word I would ever use to describe Todd. Never. No. No. Um, no. Any, any, um, and, and how did you guys like, like, uh, what was, what was his death like for you? Like what, what the hell, like, how did that happen when you're, you're like, you're not at home. Right. But you know, like you couldn't have seen it coming. Right. Or did you? Um, no, like, I totally didn't see it coming. My husband saw it coming, but I didn't see it coming. Like I saw it coming from from like a serious distance, so I didn't really expect it to come. Yeah, you know what I mean. So what would what would Dan say? I mean, when Todd got home from sober living, you know, he was he was actually like really good. And, you know, we were, he was coming over for dinner and like spending time with us and, you know, my kids. And, um, you know, it was actually like, it was really nice. Like it's, it was never like that. Um, and I mean, he wasn't even drinking, which he always said was not his problem. Um, so, you know, I mean, it was like, he wasn't even, he wasn't smoking pot around us he wasn't drinking around us so I mean he totally like had me fooled um did he then, tell you he wasn't drinking like, do you remember that yeah like I remember like we were you know out to dinner one night when, well this is when he was at sober living he was like I'm not drinking because there's people in the house that are there for alcohol so you know, I would never do that to them that's what he said to me yeah um, like not that he's trying to get sober. He really just the thing, the weirdest thing is he really didn't understand sobriety. It's no, like crazy. He, didn't. he did not no. get it. It's like he's no. this fucking ridiculous alcoholic drug addict. I mean, I remember I would hang out with Todd uh many, 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 many nights where like I would be clean, you know, and he wouldn't want to smoke weed around me. So he would come over with these Budweiser tall boys, like four of them or something. And he'd come to the apartment and he'd be drinking all this beer and he'd be like, yeah, but I don't really like it. You know, but like, but like, yeah, like he would always say it wasn't his problem. But like, meanwhile, I remember the first one I picked him up from, you know, rehab eight or nine years ago. Like the first thing we did was we went out to lunch and he ordered a beer and I was like, um, didn't he just like get out of rehab? And he's like, yeah, but alcohol's not my problem. And I'm like, okay. And I, I think that's like, an amazing point, to be honest with you, Allie. I mean, I think that's an amazing piece of it. It is, because it was like everything is your problem. It like leads to, you know, something else. But he just, he never saw that. Well, it's denial. You know, denial yeah. is a big problem. And, yeah. um, and, and it's true. Like, and I think a lot of people, uh, have that situation going on where they're, where they're heroin addicts or meth addicts or coke addicts and they, and they think they can drink or smoke weed. Right. But it's like, the truth is that anybody can do whatever they want. It's, it's, right. it's like, I mean, I, I listened to, um, I don't remember why, but I recently listened to, um, an old dopey episode and Chris said that. Basically, he's like a stove constantly running gas, and the second he puts a mind or mood altering substance into him, he's lighting the pilot light. So everything's ready to combust. And that's right. the way addicts are mostly built. And I mean, like, I know a lot of people can get by, you know, just doing one thing or another thing mm-hmm. until they can't. And that's right. what happened to Todd. Totally. You know? Yeah, because I mean, he really, like, he was for the first time in, you know, 20 years, like he wasn't mumbling, like he was saying, um, 
And then he started to avoid me, which um, is always like worrisome to me because, you know, he always could fool my mom and dad a little bit more, but like me, you know, he, when he stopped coming around because like, I mean, the one thing that Todd kind of respected, I guess, was like not to be high, like around my children or right. come with like, you can't have drugs in, in my house or whatever. So he just then wouldn't come over or he would make an excuse like not to hang out. I mean, I, I think I asked him like a million times to hang out in the last few weeks. And then he always had like an excuse. Right. I would say. So. Oh, know. it's crazy. It's crazy. Like I can get all caught up in talking about Todd like he's away. You know what I yeah. mean? Like still, right. um, like all this stuff, it's like a preamble to the fact that he's gone. Right. You know, and he's not coming back. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, how are you doing with that? I mean, it's, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty horrible because, you know, um, I'm like mad at him because, I mean, not only did he go, but, you know, now he left me with my parents who, right. you know, I mean, my mother for the last, I would say, 15 years, I would I would look at her and she just seemed so sad. Like, she almost looked like she was about to cry, like, at any, you know, at any moment. Um so she would just be like, it was almost like worry. Like I would just look at her and she just always looked like so worried. Like she wasn't breathing, you know? And, and now it's like, I don't see worry. I just see, she's just, you know, she's not the person or, you know, the mother that I had, you know? But your mother is also... You know, she was one of the most loving, caring, uh, just empathetic. And, you know, she right. She was, excuse me, um, I'm going to have to edit that. Um, she, um, your mother, your mother was, uh, was such a, a generous person and a kind person and a caring person. Um, and she always would, would believe the best. In, in Todd and in anybody. Right. And she was like, I'm not saying my mother isn't a caring and nice person, but my mom was right. like very different than your mom. They were similar in that they were these Jewish Yenta types, but my mom mm-hmm. wouldn't believe something good. My mom would right. assume the worst. And your mom yeah. would believe every no, fucking piece of bullshit. Yeah. Um, right, which yeah. drove me crazy because I'd be like, Mom, seriously? Like, really? Like, you know. But... You know, yeah, she, I don't know, she just always, um, I don't know, she just, I mean, she worried and, but, you know, she's just not, she's not, like, I think that's um, the thing that people who, like, you know, do drugs, they don't realize, like, when they do that, like, what they leave behind or what they can leave behind. You know? And so what are you saying that got left behind? I mean, I don't have the same mother. Right. I mean, I have like a, a before Todd mother and like an after Todd mother, you know? Right. She's just, you know, <laughs> totally, 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 totally damaged from it. Totally. And, uh, and then the question is how how much can she recover? You know, because I know, I know, like, um, you know, um, I'm putting together some ideas for Dopey, you know what I mean? Like this and that. And I'm going through music for the show, yeah. right? And I'll yeah. listen to a song and, uh, and I'll just think of Todd. Yeah. And, uh, and break down, you know, and yeah. Todd's just my friend. You know, we're talking about her son. All right. You know, so like, how, so how is she, how is she acting? How is the family now? I mean, like, how is she acting? She's like, I mean, she's she's coping, but 
you know, I mean, she cries every day. And I think so. Yeah, and I think she, you know, wonders, like, you know, did he love me? Did he love us? Like, but, you know, how could he do this stuff? Right. You know? You know, it's just such, like, she can't, like, understand it. You know, how if it's kind of like when, I don't know, when someone, like, I would say, like, commits suicide, it's like, if they loved you, how could they do that to you? You know, it's like, I don't think she, I just don't think that they ever thought, I think they were always worried, but, like, I really don't think anyone ever thought that it would have happened to him, you know? I mean, his friends, his, you know, I just don't think anyone really thought it could actually happen. Well, you know, me and him had a lot of conversations about it, about death, and uh, and the way he used, you know, like, it, it's like, I don't know, it's so weird, like, to talk to you about it, because Todd, as far as I could tell, Todd used heroin as safely as anybody could use heroin. Right. You know, he would use very little. He right. would sniff it. He, he like, would not mm-hmm. use a lot. Um, and, uh, and he never had money to use a lot, right. you know, and he, ne- and he was terrified of needles, you right. know, like, yeah. I don't know if, uh, you ever heard the story, but like one time in California, uh, I was living in Echo Park and, uh, and I was shooting heroin and Todd came over and I think he was like, I don't know. I don't remember what the impetus was, but he said, he said, all right, Dave, just shoot me up. Just do it. And, uh, and I said, okay, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I tied, I tied up his arm and, uh, and I went to, to shoot him up and literally the second the tip of the needle touched he his arm, out. yeah, he passed out. <laughs> yeah. He, just yeah, he was it. not, yeah, he wasn't a fit. He wouldn't even, I tried to get him to do my acupuncture one time and he was like, oh no, uh, uh-uh. uh. And I'm like, dude, it's like. They're like little, like little tiny needles. You don't even feel them. And he was like, no way. And I'm like, okay. Like, yeah. Well, Todd was, passed out a lot. Todd was a fainter. Oh, yeah, you know? he was. Where, where, where did you ever see him faint? I mean, he fainted with everything. Like, I mean, anything. Like, if someone was getting, like, their, like, blood drawn or if, like, someone was bleeding. He was always the kid who, like, passed out on the, on the ground. Oh, wait. Right. That's interesting. And, yeah. um, and, uh, and like, how, how are you doing? Like, I mean, you're, you're angry at him because, uh, because how he hurt your family and your parents. Oh, yeah. He, like, left me with, he left me with, like, you know, sick I mean, parents, damaged parents. <laughs> yes. He, like, you know, it's like the ultimate. I'm like, thanks, dude. Like, thanks a lot. Um, no, he just, like, left me with this pile of shit, I would say. It's just, you know, I mean, it's hard. Like, he, Todd took up a lot of, um, you know, my parents, like, I don't know, attention. You know, he he always took up a lot of attention. And, like, I was, I was like, okay with it because I had my own life. Like, I had a job and I had kids and... You and know, dreams. And a Jewish dreams. mother, you know, I have a Jewish mother who it's fine if someone else takes like attention away from me for, you know, a while. But now it's like just, you know, it's like everything is, you know, on me. It's like 24 seven, you know. And I'm sure there's some cosmic joke built into all that with him. <laughs> You know what I'm I mean? Sure. Like, yeah, I'm, no, I'm sure, sure, like, he he craved the attention, but he didn't want it. But, right. like, he, he was like a flame to your parents' moth. You know, even right. if he wasn't failing, he was just, Todd was such a magnet. You know what I mean? Like, at yeah. the dinner table, he was just so funny and uh, yeah. so, like, uh, yeah. Tell tell the story of that on... Um, I mean, I, I want, I want, I want to hear the cheap date story, and I want to hear the Sarah McLaughlin story. Oh my god! So Todd is like 
I mean, I don't know if you ever experienced it, but Todd is like the most, he was the most expensive person to ever take out to dinner. Like, no matter where you went, like, I mean, if me and Dan went out for like Thai food, it would be like, you know, $25 for the two of us for like a pad Thai and whatever. I mean, they don't drink, like, you know, nothing. And like, you know, we went out with Todd one night and, you know, he ordered like, some humongous, like, warm sake, probably two of them, I would say. And then, you know, orders, like, the seared tuna and then, like, sushi and, like, whatever. I mean, literally, our dinner was, like, a 100 It was, like, $100. Like, it was me and Dan was, like, 25 and he was, like, 75 bucks on. If you And if you ever said anything to him, because I'm cheap, you know what I mean? Like, I would go out and I wouldn't have any money, and I, like, oh, yeah. didn't drink. And he'd be like, like, what? Yeah, what? he'd be like, what? He'd go, what? He'd what? like, I, I can't have a nice meal? You know, what? Right. You know, and he was yeah. like, he'd be so funny. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, like, we went, and, like, it's, yeah, it's just, but it was like, it was like always, it was actually like the joke. I mean, we can't, we don't joke about it anymore. Maybe, like, in a few years, we'll be able to. But it was always like when, you know, my parents would come with us like to the Cape for the summer so that like we could have a babysitter to go out or something. And every year we would always joke like, Oh, should we ask Todd, you know, to come with us? And my, my mom would be like, what are you crazy? Who ordered like a lobster roll at every meal? It'd be like $500, you know, a day just to like, feed him. You know, <laughs> just to feed him. And like, yeah. and I mean, we went to St. Martin like years ago and we went to like, barbecue joint where like everyone orders like ribs or chicken or whatever and like there's Todd ordering like the two pound Caribbean lobster which is like who knows like fifty dollars or something for or probably even more for a lobster and it's like it was just like a big joke it would be like four of us could eat for like fifty dollars and then there was like Todd you know who you know he never had money to like ever you know pay for anything so I think once in a while, like when I first came back from Los Angeles, he was delivering weed and he was making a fortune of money. Yeah. And he like, I think one time he like took me and, and Jenny out to dinner yeah. and like, it was like, you know, he ordered everything and it was like the first yeah. time it was like the only, and then I had seen Todd do that before, but used like your parents' credit cards and stuff. Yeah. But like, it was the one time I actually saw him, like... And then I've also seen him do it, like, when he was... Like, once in a while, he would sell weed on his own and have a, just a fortune of money, you know, mm-hmm. like, once in a while. And he would model yeah. himself after these, like, upscale weed dealers <laughs> who, like, could afford to buy whatever they wanted. And, and he really wanted to be like that, yeah. you know? Um so funny, like yeah. like just to think about him, just all of the spots I would be in with him. Um, yeah. But uh, tell the Sarah McLaughlin story. So you know, Todd moved. He moved home, like to live with my parents. This was, I mean, this must have been. I don't. I don't remember if this was like before sober living. Do you remember if it was before or after? It's kind of the last. Both. I think both. Yeah. I think he lived there before and after. All right. So he like moved home and he, you know, just went to do his typical thing of like getting the restaurant job. And he actually got this, you know, restaurant job at this nice place. Um, and like, I won't say the name, but it was, you know, within like 25 minutes of us. And I remember him coming home from his first day. He's like, Oh, I totally got the job, dude. Like, fucking manager like loved me but it's like the weirdest thing and I'm like okay and I'm like well what's weird and he's like I totally fucked her in high school and I'm like <laughs> okay <laughs> and uh, I'm like did she go to your high school he's like no and I'm like all right and I'm like so did you re- did she remember you and he's like no and I'm like, okay, well, how did you remember her? And he's like, because her name was Sarah McLaughlin. Like, you can't forget. <laughs> you can't forget that. And I'm like, well, would you have recognized her? He's like, no. But, like, you know, then when I saw her name, and I'm like, okay, so, like, you wouldn't have recognized her. Like, you look nothing like you did in high school. Like, he looks like 
Jesus in high school. I mean, he had like a fro, a beard. I mean, you know, he was like, do you, do you remember seeing pictures of him in high school? Like he had a whole lot of hair. Well, I remember him in college. I mean, yeah. when I met him, when I met him, he was like clean cut with, with like a preppy kind of haircut. But a, a few years later, he had a full shaggy beard and yeah. long hair. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, that's how he was in high school. So, I mean, there was no way that this girl was like, I didn't remember him, but he was so mad about it. And then, um, I think like a, like maybe like a couple weeks went by and, um, and all of a sudden, he came over. He was like, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? And he's like, I got fired. And I'm like, okay. And he said they, like, did a, his background check, I guess, like, two weeks after he had started. And they just said that, like, it wasn't going to work out or something like that. And so he was like, you know what that means? And I was like, what? He's like, she totally, like, remembered me. That's why she <laughs> hired me. Like, it was just. He couldn't believe it was like for some other reason. He thought like it was because she finally remembered him, and he was because he was late, and because he was high on the yeah. job, and because he fucks everything up, right. and because he smoked. Yeah, and shit. but it was just, no. I mean, it was just so funny because he just like you know thought he was just so memorable. Like, how did she not recognize my name or you know whatever? And then he was like, he'd be like, you know, what did she like sleep with a million people in high school that she can't remember? I mean, it was just it was. So, so Todd, so, so Todd, like yeah, you know, he, he loved. He would also get really worked up about stuff like that, and everything. that was what made he him so everything. Yeah, but that's why he was so great. You know what I mean? Yeah. He would make such a big deal about everything, and it was like, and he it would all crescendo into the funniest fucking shit oh, yeah. every time. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, every everything was like you know had to be so dramatic with with Todd, everything. Can you think of another, another, another funny example? I don't know. Like, I can't think of one right now, but. Oh, well, you give me one when you can never think of one. And, uh, and why don't you give some, uh, give some guidance to, cause like there are people who listen to the show who have brothers and sisters who are getting high, who have partners, yeah. who have kids. And, you know, like, what do you, what do you tell these people? You know, like. I, mean, I, I would tell them that like, I mean, no matter how much, you know, Todd messed up, you know, I never, like, gave up on him or, you know, I know a lot of people just cut him out of their lives, but I don't know. I don't know how you can live with that if something were to happen, but I think, you know, I guess I had, I wish I had maybe like dug a little deeper into Todd and, you know, said like how, I mean, I always tried to help him, but like he never really took me up on it. So, well, but the question wasn't like, what could you have done differently? Because there's a million things we all could have done differently. Yeah, of course. It's like, it's like you, like how do uh, you deal? You're a woman who saw, who had a brother who, Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you, how do you cope with, with your brother being gone? You know, think, being dead, being dead from drugs, you know, I'll right. just be blunt. Um, I don't know. I think you just ha- have to take it like day by day. And I do go to um, a meeting once a month called GRASP, and it's for people who are grieving um, people like related to, um, you know, drug or alcohol deaths. And I just think like, maybe getting involved and helping people that are like on this earth right now. So that the same thing doesn't happen, I guess. Right. To someone else. So that's like kind of your new mission is, is to, is to, is to try to use your experience to help the next person. Basically. Yeah. And definitely like probably be really careful about drugs because there's fentanyl and absolutely everything. Right. You know, a scary All right, Allie, what are you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for his birthday? You're going to yeah. pre- try to pretend it doesn't happen. What, you, what are your folks going to do? I don't know. I I we haven't figured out. I mean, my boys want to get balloons and send them up to heaven for him. That's so, 
Um, I don't know. Hope to figure out, I mean, something to do. Probably eat like burgers or ice cream or something, which is like, a two pound you know, lobster. Yeah. <laughs> two pound lobster in order. He would or, like to do. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Order drinks at the Thai restaurant. Spend a hundred bucks yeah. at the Thai restaurant for time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do something to celebrate him. But yeah, I don't know. We'll do something. Well, um, I appreciate you coming on and, uh, and talking a little bit about what happened and, um, yeah. you know, it's not about how he died. You know what I mean? Like we know how he died. It's about, it's about missing him and, oh, right. uh, and remembering him, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like how he impacted, how he made our lives better. And he did, mm-hmm. you know, yep. but thank yep. you, Allie. And, um, <laughs> and I love you. And, uh, if you ever need anything from me, you know, I'm around. Thanks, Dave. Sure, Allie. Bye. All right. Bye. So that was Todd's sister, Allie, and I recorded all these things separately. So it's a little weird flow, but obviously um, we got a lot out of Allie and her family has been through hell. Um, and here's someone else who was really affected by Todd's death. I recorded it a few days ago, so here he is. So I've got on the phone uh, one of Todd's best friends, a guy who I've known actually for a little while now, and this is Rob. Say what's up. How's it going? And you listen to a little bit of Dopey here and there, right? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I listen to the Artie episode. Uh-huh. Uh, I listen to the. I listen to your special on uh, the American Life. Right. And then I heard part of uh, part of another one, and then. Um, the, only re- the only reason, honestly, and I don't think I've ever spoken to you about this. Um, the reason why I never listened to it, um, and my friends do, um, who you know, Ryan and Vince, and who are, you know, some Todd's very close friends, they listen to it all the time. Um, I guess I don't have that in me because I knew what it was going to be about. Um, at least the things about Todd and you know I I didn't have that relationship with Todd of the drug side besides you know the weed and the fish tour and 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 that sort of stuff but I didn't have the the heroin side um so to me that wasn't anything that that I knew or or really wanted to know um right you didn't you also didn't use with todd like like uh hardcore addict wise you know what i mean you were around todd when he smoked crazy bud and like you never took pills with him and did you ever trip with him uh maybe once back like at Sugar Bush for a fish show in like ninety five or ninety four. <laughs> so, let's let's back up though. You let, why don't you talk about like uh, where did you meet Todd and 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 how did you know Todd? Yeah, so Todd was a year older than me. We grew up in the same town. I always knew of Todd. You know, we kind of ran in similar circles. Um, but one summer, going into my senior year, and I think he was going to Ithaca. Um, cause he was a year older. We actually met at a party and like, he was, you know, kind of crazy guy, the life of the party. And uh, he was this, you know, short dude who had this, you know, he was like his hairy chest. He's out in the backyard with like, you know, jumping in the pool and like, he had no care in the world, but he was like, he was what he was. He's what everybody know, knew him as, you know, he was the life of the party. He was a fun fun guy and we would always you know after that we just became really really good friends like all of a sudden like after that night it was really strange like he was going off to college but that whole summer he and I and and a few other guys hung out and you know we kind of like started a band and um you know, it was it was kind of cool hanging out with. Cause I went to this Catholic military school and it sucked, but hanging out with these other guys who were, you know, in you know, in this band and like they seemed like they were like kind of cool guys and I'm like I knew none of that because I was at this 
lame ass school. You right. know? And they were like so, super free and easy, sort of hippie exactly, types. Exactly. Right. Totally. And I was, you know, I was, that wasn't my sort of thing. But uh, yeah. And so then, you know, we've been, you know, I would say he's one of my best friends for the last, you know, 25 years. Exactly. And, um, and me too. And, uh, and I think that you and I, like, a weird thing about us is, like, we would be with Todd when the other one wasn't. You know what I mean? Like, That's totally, yeah, totally true. Yeah, it was his city life and then his suburban life, you know, and, and that's what it was. Like, when he wasn't up here, I knew he was going to be down there hanging out with you guys. So, yeah, totally. What a mess, though, man. And I know that, like... You know, you you saw his decline over the years. You know, and he was he was on the West Coast, obviously. So you didn't know when. And, and he also like loved to lie about what was going on. He also didn't think that you would be you specifically would be able to handle the serious hardcore, you know, drugs because he knew that wasn't your thing. Like when did when did it start to become clear to you what was going on with him? So when he was out in LA, he came home and we went out to um, went out to see this band. And uh, I went over to his parents' house where he was staying. And I think he was, you know, going to be going back out to out to LA. And he was like emaciated. He looked he looked like shit. And you know, that was the first time I had ever sort of knew that that. He had alluded to it basically at that point, and that was the first time I saw it. Then he came home from from uh, California, and he was actually living with me for two years, um, and it was fine. You know, I I wasn't married, didn't have kids at that point, and you know, I had this house, so I was like, you know, it's cool. It'd be fun. Todd's going to be here. We'll you know we'll do what we do, and you know, as soon as he got up here, you know, we're, I'm in, you know, outside of, of uh, you know, Albany, outside of Saratoga. And I always, you know, I always found it so incredible with Todd. He could sniff out drugs from anybody. And so one, one day I was in my basement that he and I and this other guy had used to, you know, we jam and everything. And I was, it was furnished, so I was cleaning everything, and I moved the couch, and there was a whole bag of needles and, like, a spoon, and obviously the first thing that comes to my mind is, that's Todd, that's Todd shit, I'm fucking furious, I'm fu- I can't believe he brought this shit into my house, and, you know, this is, this is probably 14 years ago, this, so this is way before heroin is this thing that's on everybody's mind and so I was fucking like furious with him and I brought it up to him and he's like that's not mine that's the other dude who was in the band and I'm like what are the fucking odds that he finds another guy to play in the band with us who lives outside of freaking Albany New York in this little shit town and the dude does heroin well, that's you know, it's like heroin, and, you know, and, and that was always the thing with Todd. He would, you know, he he would find like if I had Ativan or something in the house, you know, he he could find it. He could find it in my car. You know, it was crazy. But I, you know, but I don't know that lifestyle. I don't know the, the lifestyle of somebody who who's an addict who who uses like that. So, yeah, he, so that, that was. Yeah, that was, you know, just going back to your question on that, that's where it sort of, I started seeing it. Um, and then and then he moved down, he, you know, after a couple of years living there, he moved down to the city, which, you know, you know, some, some people say, you know, some of my friends go, oh, that was the worst thing for him. But you want to know what? <laughs> was it? I mean, he, he, he died up here. Right. He died. You know, at his parents' house. So it, it was matter. a miracle that he didn't die in his parents' apartment. It was like there's no reason that he, there, there's no rhyme or reason to when uh, he was going to die. You know, and, and I, I mean, like, and uh, well, I never thought he would because he 
to me, he he was he was Keith Richards, man. That dude, we would always joke about that. That he could do more drugs than I mean. Look, you know, I'm not a big drug guy. I'll, you know, I'll puff now and again, and you know, I drink. But I, you know, that sort of thing. It was amazing the amount that he could consume. And so I always thought he he would be fine. And I think he would have been, honestly, if it wasn't, I mean, maybe I, I could be wrong, but if it wasn't for, you know, the fentanyl, um, I think that maybe he would have just kept going and it would have been an issue and a problem and, you know, something would have happened eventually, obviously, but not not at the rate that it did. Well, I know, I don't know if you remember this, but over, I mean, over the years, you and I talked a bunch because um, I would get clean and then I would decide I was very worried about Todd and we would talk about it. And um, do you remember that? Like we talked about it a few times here and oh, there. Yeah. Like what oh, was I mean, going on? I remember when he got arrested on fish tour down in Virginia and yeah, I remember specifically speaking to you about that. Yeah, he got, I mean, he, he would put himself into some... I mean, like, terrible situations. He got arrested selling ecstasy to undercover FBI agents, which, like, even that, I mean, like, I think there's something also wrong with me, Rob, because, like, Dopey, the whole point of Dopey, it was basically invented out of, like, Todd. You know what I mean? Like, everything Todd did, I thought, was just the funniest thing in the world. And even, I mean, like, the only thing that wasn't funny about selling ecstasy to undercover FBI agents in Virginia was that he was going to have a felony. And that felony was going to be, you know, I, I think it was a pillar in the end of Todd's life of what made him so unhappy. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, it definitely was. I mean, he, you know, he couldn't pass background tests, you know, or checks, you know, and and I think that, yeah, no, that was that was rough because then he was, you know, I, I think I recall he was back up in the city afterwards, and like he was in like Rikers Island. Well, did you ever hear that yeah. story? Yeah, from him. What did he tell and you? Like, but well, that's the thing is, like, he told the story, and like, I'm like. Did that really happen, or was Todd just like so out of it? He told me like a story of like some some guy like getting beaten by a by a correction officer, and like he told me about how he got busted like by like a bike cop or something, you know, something along those lines. The story he you told know, me. It's all half. It was all. I'm sure either it, it wasn't all there, you know. Oh yeah, but he also he knew his audience. Yeah, you know, he told me a story that he was on the Lower East Side, like to get methadone or something, and he was on his bike on the sidewalk, and he had heroin in his pocket, and he yeah. got a ticket for having a bike on the sidewalk, and they busted him because he had the heroin in his pocket, and he yeah, went to was... he went to Rikers, he went into full blown withdrawal at Rikers. And he saw somebody die at Rikers. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what what I heard. So I mean, it was actually the same story. I just you know can't re recall it wow. as well as you. But yeah. Well, I thought that when he went to Rikers, it could be a good thing for him because like maybe it would be something that finally scared him. You know, because Todd got away with so much shit in his life. He was mm -hmm. he would always get away with shit. And um, and I thought here he wasn't getting away with shit. And then my ex girlfriend stepped in and found him and bailed him out out of nowhere, you know, which was good. I mean, he shouldn't, you know. The the point is though, when he came out of there, and then he couldn't hold the job together, like, you know, he just he didn't want to live. But this is not the point. Was not to be sad. The point was to celebrate. The, the I mean, because Todd was, like, for my money, he was, like, one of the most fun people I ever knew. And um, and he, his, him, in, him personally, he was like a drug. You hung out with Todd and you felt good because he was full of so much joy and life. And, um, you know, do you, can, you, can you give me any, like, classic, ridiculous story uh, from your relationship with him? I, 
Honestly, you know, you you had you know a little behind the scenes. You had asked me to come up with something, and like it was. I feel like I mean, there's a million because of the fact that, but I would have to like sit down and like kind of come up with like a way to like tell this story, but. I'm like sort of looking at it and and I apologize if this isn't, you know, I look at it like Todd at the end, you know, and now it's been at this point, it's been, I think 10 months, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I still have these amazing, amazing memories of him and, and my wife, I think she, I think Todd was her favorite person. I, and I think it, it really hit her hard when, when he passed. And I don't mean to be morose on this and, you know, be a little bit down on this, but. Be remember, no, Rob, it's fine. It's, that's it, one of it, our best friends died. You know, you can be however yeah, you want to be. So we had, I think really why a few reasons why it just hit hard for her and I can sort of you know see it from her view and maybe this will make sense to to the people listening is that we had in uh, just a year ago April April 12th we had our first and only daughter after trying really hard for a long time and you know Todd was around her so much the baby in the two months yeah in the two months and we have this amazing picture up at lake george of him holding um holding her and it just seemed like he was really happy around her and um we were you know me and my at that point fiance now wife we're, we're just about to get married you know a month, less than a month after um he died and I think for the probably the first two or three weeks after he passed, it was hard not associating Todd with my new daughter and seeing that and having just look, having a sad feeling because I couldn't get him out of my mind and my wife, Jen, she would be crying and she would, I'd wake up in the morning and hear her cry. And, but at the same time, we had this beautiful new baby and we were going to get married. And I think that, you know, that's what just made it so much harder was that these, these were like two things, the wedding, he was the first person who sent an RSVP. He was like, so psyched for the wedding. And it was, it was, it was hard, and you know, you look. Everybody who who listens knows the stories from Todd, and Todd can tell a story way the hell better than I can. Um, but maybe the thing that that he can't <laughs> couldn't do as well was really, you know, discuss what hurt him. Because he, he didn't do that too often with me. Um, and I was probably one of his best friends. I mean, I I would imagine, you know, me, yourself, Sean, um, and I didn't hear that stuff. And that was, you know, partially an issue. So, yeah, I could sit here and tell you, like, a funny story or something like that. But to me, when I get the call from Allison, uh, Allison's uh, husband, Todd's sister's husband, um, and I saw it come up Allison Curry on on my phone. I just you know figured, oh Todd, it, you know maybe he's in the hospital or something. And it was her husband, and he just bluntly said that Todd died. And I've I've never reacted like like I did at that point. It was it was a mix between shock and just complete and utter sadness. It wasn't anger, it wasn't any of that. It was just, it was just pure sadness that this guy that brought me so much joy for 25 years, yeah. 
um, he I, was not. That was the hardest thing to, to grasp was just that he's he's not going to be around anymore. Um, and Jen still says to me, "I miss Todd. I miss Todd." And it, you know, you know, because I'm sure I know you. You, I believe you lost your mom. You know that it gets a little bit easier as the months go on, and it has. Um, but when I think about it, um, it's not great. No, no. Uh, but luckily, our you know our minds are built so that we can't luckily fixate on these things, and we can then you know move on and look at our daughter and smile again and, and things like that. But it doesn't make it any less hard when you know I have this conversation and you know I can I can do it now without crying, which is good. Right. Uh, it was really really tough but you know uh you called me to tell me that he died um and i had a kind of similar um i don't know i had a weird situation i was in the kitchen in our house with linda and uh nora and the baby and we were giving the baby a bath and um and you called me and uh and i showed linda you know that it was you and Linda said, I think something bad happened. And I I just kind of, I didn't know that Todd was dead, but I knew that we were getting close to that place. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just kind of, you know, Todd lived like, Todd didn't want to live. You know, he told me that straight up to my face. I couldn't even believe it when he told me that. Um, but when you told me he had died, you know, I couldn't accept it, you know? Um, I was angry at his parents and whatever. whatever. I just, I went into a weird denial kind of thing. And then I sat in the backyard and I cried, you know, hysterically. And my daughter saw me crying. It was, I think it was the first time she ever saw me cry. And um, she said I looked like a monkey. Uh, but I couldn't stop crying, you know? And, uh, and, and you know, and six weeks later, my, Chris died. And, um, and it was just like, I couldn't even believe it. Um, and, uh, and at this point in my life, um, I don't, I, I cry for both of them, Rob, you know, I do here and there. Uh, but with Todd, like it could be a song, you know, the other morning I was, I was like looking for songs and, uh, there's an old Toots and the Maytal song, 5446, That's My Number. You know that song? I don't know. And uh, and it came on the mix or whatever, and I just started crying uh, for Todd. You know, because uh, he was just such a, you know, I just, I don't, I never would have pinned myself as somebody who would be friends with Todd or who would love Todd the way I love Todd. But I did, and... Um, it's just, you know, I hear what you're saying, you know what I mean? And you're right. You know, uh, w life is about loss and the human brain is conditioned to fucking get to the next place. Um, but you know what I want you to do? I want to make you do something that you don't want to do. I want you to tell the story because um, I remember he told me the story. And then maybe you'll remember it and you won't remember it. I don't remember it. He didn't tell it on Dopey. If you can't remember it, I don't care. Don't worry about it. But when you guys went to Jones Beach for fish and, like, he almost got arrested, but he didn't get arrested or something? Well, that, yeah, so, well, that was, I mean, that was the lucky side of Todd because, you know, we talk about the fact that he got busted for selling to cops, but... <laughs> which is, you know, in and of itself crazy, but he should have gotten busted a million times. And obviously you were at, in, at Ithaca, you know, when he initially got busted. No, I was gone already. I, I had I had transferred. Oh, you had? Okay. Because, I mean, that's the reason why he ended up, you know, up at Oswego with me was, you know, he got booted for for the acid in the freezer. But The 200 hit of acid story, which yeah, he actually, exactly. he told that story on Dopey. I had never heard the full story, and he told it on Dopey. Um, 
and he was on heroin when he told that story at my father's house. But tell tell this this guess getting yeah, away so, with it at Jones Beach. So yeah, we're at we're at fish at Jones Beach, and we're just in the lot, and me and this other guy. There's three of us there, and Todd's in the back seat of um, my buddy Mike's car, and he's just sitting there and he's just rolling joints. Yeah. And it was our job. We were facing each other out in the parking lot, me and this dude, Mike. And our jobs were to watch in each direction because there were these park troopers or, you know, cops that would come around. And, you know, they weren't, you know, they were real police. And so all of a sudden, just like out of nowhere, the dude that I was with, Mike, he just didn't do the job right because all of a sudden this cop was just right there with like a full cop car and <laughs> he comes out and he sees Ty in the back of the car just being looking just so sketchy she was just I mean he looked ridiculous and so he comes up and like Todd like looks out of the car and up at the officer and we're sitting back and we're going that's it we're fucked I mean he's gonna not only you know whatever he's going to do, but this is in our buddy's car. Something's going to happen here. So he searches Todd and Todd had like five different types of drugs on him. He had, he had Molly, he had uh Valium, you know, he had obviously had weed. Um, I think he had heroin no. too. I, I think I'm so. I'm sure he did. But yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, he didn't tell me that, that right. was in the, right. in the mix. You know, exactly. So, we're just sitting, I mean, there's no reason that Todd shouldn't have gotten arrested and taken away because he saw all these pills and all this other shit. And then the cop just goes, all right, man, just, you know, just don't be doing that out in public and <laughs> lets him go. And like, there was, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, there was absolutely, absolutely no reason to, to do it. He should have, I mean, Todd should have gotten arrested right then and there. And it was, you know, it, I guess it's just Todd's luck. And we had a great show. But then at that show, it goes back to, we're sitting there and this is me looking, watching him sniff out people and buying Molly from them in the audience during a show. He like can find the people not who has who have weed and you know who's smoking weed that's obvious but people who have you know drugs yeah and he's sitting there buying yeah he's sitting there buying molly you know in the middle of a show from some dude who he's never met in his entire life and this was not two hours after the bus yeah probably should be in a in a jail cell did the cops take the 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 ecstasy off of him or no no, he he let him have everything. He didn't take one thing. Yeah, he didn't take anything. Yeah, but that was, I mean, that was something that was like, it's like that was Todd's hobby. That was the thing, and that's why Todd couldn't get better. Todd only liked getting fucked up, and he only liked going to fish shows, and he loved scoring drugs. He loved it. I mean, I loved it too, but Todd fucking loved that shit because he loved connecting with strangers through it. He loved talking to people. He just loved that aspect of his life. And um, I remember, you know, and I think I've told you about this conversation, and I'm sure I've talked about it on the show. Um, he couldn't keep a job, you know, and he had gotten his last job in Manhattan was in this uh Olive Tree Cafe, which is above the Comedy Cellar on Sullivan Street, and uh, and he would always brag to me about talking to Artie Lang and all the comedians that would come and all the money he could make and this and that. Um, but then I went to see him because I hadn't seen him in a while, and Todd never wanted to see me when I was sober and he was using. Uh, Todd liked to consider me like this this bad drug addict that he you know that he wouldn't be as bad as me. He always held that over my head. Um, but so when I was clean, he like didn't want to deal with me. So I went to go see him because I missed him, you know. And um, and I was like, Todd, just come take a walk with me, you know. And we took this walk, and he told me how um, how all he wanted to do was get high, and how all he wanted to do was go see fish, and how that was those were his interests. You know what I mean? That was what he, like, he there was nothing else that really interested him. And um, you know. 
it's just sad. I mean, he said to me that he didn't want to live anymore. And, um, and I looked at him and I said, dude, you're 40, you're 42. I think I said, you can live another 42 years and they can be better years. And he didn't want to hear about it. You know what I'm saying? No, he, he, yeah. And you know, his, his rehabs were always, you know, half-assed as far as he would, Still drink, you'd still drink, and you'd still smoke, bud. And I, I don't mean to laugh, but you know, he would come home from rehab, and you know, he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm clean now," and he'd be drinking, you know, and smoking weed. It, well, it, yeah, yeah, it's just like smoking a bad amount of weed, and like, you know, I, I, look, I'm not, I'm not somebody who is against weed or I'm not a huge weed guy I mean I, it's fine whatever no issues with it but you know if you're trying to be sober um, alcohol and, and, and smoking weed you know can't they can't help well they're not being you know? it's not sober you know no it's not sober and I mean you know and that was the thing that I always you know with Todd he's one of those guys and, and everybody has a few of these friends out there who can get up in the morning and they they puff and they puff throughout the day and to me that's just like that's insane because like you're you're just high all day and like how you equate how Todd equated that with with being okay and being sober was beyond me but you know okay if you're doing that and you're not doing heroin that's fine, but it was never the case. So well, he would do that. I mean, the the I would always say to him, "You're not going to be able to just smoke weed." You know, it's a nice idea that you could just sure. smoke weed, of but course. you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to get high on bud, and you're going to miss getting high on heroin, and it's that's what's going to happen. And you know, that is what happened. Not to mention, like, I mean, for me in recovery. It's about having freedom and choices and the ability to, like, be who I want to be. You know, I loved getting high. I loved, I loved smoking pot. I loved smoking pot as much as he did. It's just I knew that, like, and I'm not saying I don't smoke. I don't, I don't not smoke pot because I'm scared of heroin. I don't smoke pot because if I smoke pot, I'll smoke pot all day. And if I smoke pot all day, I don't think I'm going to get half the things done that I want to get done, and I won't be able to really be myself. And I and I think in Todd's situation, he didn't want to feel like himself. He was like, Dave, I don't want to fucking not get stoned. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to do that. And um, he didn't really give it a chance. You know, he didn't give himself a chance, which is the saddest part to me. Yeah, because, you know, obviously... Two months before he passed, he was in that, you know, that hardcore, you know, rehab place, you know, the assisted, whatever. Sober it was living, called. yeah. Sober living place. And, you know, so it went from that to, to where it is now in, you know, in two months. So it, it was, you know, unfortunately, you know, it was destined you know to go that way um you know if, if any of these things couldn't help then you know maybe you know he obviously he wasn't meant to just keep going so no exactly and then here we are you know what i mean and his birthday is this week and um yeah. and that's why i wanted to do this i mean i wanted to do this because i love todd um I want. I just want people to know, like, what an amazing guy he he was, and that um, if you're anything like him, you don't have to die. That's really my point with this whole thing. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know, I I completely agree, and that you know, that's always been been my thing, and sort of going back to originally what I was talking about, just you know, Todd was a great guy, so. You know, I try not to. You know, this is fine. This is great. You know, us talking about this and talking about this stuff because you know it is part of the the narrative of Todd. It's part of this whole thing, his his story. But you know, to me, 
um, it's only, you know, a, a small portion of it. Um, the heroin part. The weed part is a huge portion for Todd. And my <laughs> thing with Todd, he was always he was always that guy. He was way ahead of his times with weed. Way ahead. But, uh, you know, that to me that was more just comical than than scary and then it turns scary so yeah yeah but all right man i appreciate it i really do appreciate uh you being in this thing and i know that he would have loved that you're in it even though he would have been embarrassed because he didn't want you to know all the stuff he did and he did a lot of crazy stuff you know like he never got he, he told me some story <clears throat> where he was working for dog the bounty hunter and he went to Colorado and uh, and he had run out of heroin and I think he wanted to find coke and he wound up finding crack and like that was the only story I wanted him to tell on Dopey and we never got there um, I actually tweeted at Dog the Bounty Hunter's wife to see if she could tell the story but I don't think she's going to respond to my tweet No. Um, but Todd is that guy man I mean he he uh, he's one of our best friends, and uh, and and you, you know we'll never meet anybody like him again. Not totally. But I appreciate you calling in, and uh, I hope I see you soon. Yeah, definitely. We'll see each other this summer. Right on, man. All right. Cool. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Steve. Right on. Have a good one. You too. Bye. So those were two upstate voices, Allie and Rob. And next we have one of my uh, oldest friends uh, who I've wanted to have on Dopey for a long time. This is Dave. Uh, another Dave. Yo, Dave. What's happening? What's happening? This is very exciting. All right. Dopey Nation. Uh, very exciting moment in the history of Dopey. On the phone right now. Can I use your initials or should I just call you Dave? Uh, initials are fine. Okay. It's my very, very old friend. Dear friend, one of my favorite people uh, to have ever walked the earth, the DK. DK, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. DK. Hello, Dopey Nation. Hello, Dave. Hello. I have to say that um, out of anybody on the show, besides Todd, you know, I, I use drugs with, with DK more than anybody else. You know, <laughs> we we did it. And if you guys remember a long time ago when me and Chris were starting to do the show, uh, I told an episode about sneaking into Madison Square Garden, and that was with Dave. It, it was. It was glorious. It was glorious. It was one of the greatest moments of our life. It was, it was a magical night. And uh, and Dave and I uh, met in Ithaca uh, when we also met Todd. And Dave actually met Todd first. And 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 we were thick as thieves. And we hung out. Uh, all of us hung out from one end of the country to the other, uh, from one dimension, you know, to as many as we could possibly get to. We were so consumed with getting high, right? I, basically, yeah. I think that was it. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just suddenly got nervous. Don't get nervous. <laughs> Nobody listens to this stupid show. I swear, don't even think about it. <laughs> it's funny. That's what I do. That's how I trick myself. Is I, I think one of the first times we got high was when I crawled in through your window at Ithaca. Weren't you smoking a bong outside of the... Definitely, definitely. And you were drunk, and you crawled into the window, and like we had like an aquarium channel on the TV, and like listening to reggae or something, and and you were like, "What are you guys doing?" And then you got high, and like and like you were forever. It ruined your life. It was like it was basically it ruined your life. Um, but didn't you meet Todd? Um, like, wasn't Todd the first person you met at school? I didn't. I met Todd briefly for orientation, but Todd's mom and my mom got along famously. Right. And they met, and she was like, "Well, you've got to meet this boy, Todd." And I was like, "And I met Todd," and I was like, "I don't know if I'm I'm down with Todd." He was he was you know I was a Spielberg nut and listened to classical music and and. uh you know, or soundtracks. I didn't even listen to classical, but Todd was this hippie kid who was, you know, full on party. I really wasn't 
big when I first first got to if the guy wasn't big on the party, but he was. He yeah, was, you know, he was a he was full blown. Todd was he was Todd was like almost a, it's like when you first meet Todd he was almost a caricature you know he he was almost like not to be believed that he could be a real person like that yeah he was yeah it wasn't until I started smoking weed that I got Todd Right, I still, I did, it took me years to get Todd. I remember I would hang out with Todd, and I would be like, why are we hanging out with this guy? You remember, I mean, like, I'd be like, this guy, this guy is, like, retarded. But then, like, me and Ryan started selling weed, and Todd started being like, why don't we go in together? And we would go down to his apartment and split, you know, ounces of bud and break them up, and we'd split them and sell them. And there was just something so lovable about him. And so fun. He, it was fun. He was. It was always fun when Todd was around. Yes. It just became. Yeah, it became a party. It became some other. I mean, it was the other side. You go to the other side with Todd. Like, let's get to the other side. Yeah. We're going to the other side, boys. Yeah, and that, and that, yeah, and that was his. That was that was what he wanted to do, and he, it was never enough. And then the three of us would always challenge each other on how far we could go. <laughs> yes. I mean that became a thing, right? Well, do you remember the lifestyle? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I think that was the thing, wasn't it? It was like the lifestyle. What was you it? Needed, it was like how much weed you could smoke, how many, whatever you could do. You know, the more the better. It was. Well, we I remember calling it the lifestyle. I don't remember that. I do remember the other side, and I do remember that we lived it like it was everything. And it's like it's obvious that we would all become hard drug addicts. You know, I didn't. Yeah, for me, it was it was a long slide into the into the deep dark realms of narcotics. Yeah, because early on it was fun. It was smoking weed, eating you know, eating acid and mushrooms, and you know, kind of lighter fare, like right. psychedelia. I think dark for you, I think for you, I think that you kind of bandied about the dark side, but it wasn't until your ex girlfriend. Uh, got you interested I mean but we were interested in it before that But she was like the conduit to go To the terrible places For me yeah that It was totally, can we say names Yeah you can say her first name don't say her last name Yeah for me Jenny was Was kind of like a, a gateway to the, To the dark side Yeah cause if I think about it When we were living together uh, and you started dating Jenny. Jenny had done a lot more drugs than we had. Oh, and she'd been to jail, and yeah, no, there was. She was like, she'd done stuff that I couldn't even think you could come back from. And right, I was, I was completely smitten with with the idea that she was such a bad girl. Well, she was a bad girl. She was. She was. Yeah. Oh man, She's hardcore. And that, and that. I mean, but somehow, like. Like, she was the way she was, and we started doing, you know, coke, and then, and then we started doing dope, and, um, and she started doing dope, and that's how you got a habit, was because she started doing dope. 100%. That's exactly what happened. I got a I habit. I think I Mark Gargano once. Huh? But then, I, do you remember Mark? Uh, Mike Gargano Oh yeah sure oh, I, I can't It's okay It's it. okay I'm sure he's dead <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not dead Mike But I know he's not Listening to the show uh, What about him? Know. If he is Hi Mike What it's about him? a long time I did it with him Once or with the, Remember that other Kid uh, Oscar Dude I worked for Oscar Tell that story And then let's get into Todd well, <laughs> I don't even what the, the Oscar over, overdosing in my dorm room. Yeah, and I, yeah, I got him kicked out of school unintentionally. Tell that you're not telling the story well. What what exactly happened? Yeah, uh, shit, man, I haven't even thought about that in years. Uh, I it's 
very vague. And also, hold on, hold on. Dopey Nation, you need to know that this kid, Oscar, was the kid who, when I was a private eye and went to see the cable guy, that was Oscar. Uh, you know, so they, they, a lot of the Dopey Nation loves that story. Um, you know, Oscar became, Oscar got me a job as a private eye, but the way we met him was he, he wasn't one of your sweet mates, was he? No, he wasn't. But he hung out with the with the kids in my suite. Right. He was always there, and he was getting he was getting high on, you know, he was doing smack in the suite with the I forget who who it was. It was probably Mike, and then God, I don't even remember the other kids' names. What was art school? It was a bunch of artists who wanted to do heroin. It, yeah, that was it. They all wanted to be Kerouac or whoever the fuck they wanted to be, and they were all we were pretty. Beat Nikki, yeah, and yeah, and Oscar. I came home once, and Oscar was like passed out, and Mike was sitting in the room, and they were they had the TV on, and I kind of looked at Oscar, and he was kind of pale, and he had drool going down. <laughs> so I never really even paid attention to anybody on heroin at all. You know, it was kind of new, and and I said, hey, Mike, I think you know Oscar. Oscar looks pretty bad. He's drooling, and Mike freaked out. He goes, "What? What?" And he ran out of the room. And I was like, "Okay, you know." And I tried to shake him and wake him up, and he would not wake up. And Mike came back in the room and said, "Oscar's fucked up. Call the paramedics or do something." And ran out and ran away. And I I didn't know what the hell to do, so I just. I called the paramedics and I was like, I got this guy here. He's unresponsive. He doesn't look like he's breathing or anything. And the paramedics came and it was a huge, you know, a huge scene there. They revived him. I think he, I, he did stop breathing. And, but they revived him. He came back. And then subsequently, got kicked out of school. Out, he was on heroin. He got kicked out of school. I think his father disowned him or something, and he came back. He actually came back and he thanked me, which was very sweet. And I think that's when I got invited out to, weren't you guys, like, you were doing an investigation on a nightclub or something? Yeah, we were, we were like, going to the limelight in the tunnel, posing, the posing as club goers, and we were private eyes. We all went there together. Were you there the night they kicked me out because they thought I was smoking cocaine? And, and they kicked me out, and I was like, no, man, it's just really good, bud. And they were like, they kicked me out. Were you there that night? <laughs> was that the night Oscar threw your shoe across the... No, I threw my shoe at Oscar. Uh, oh, that's right. Years later, because he didn't pay me for a job. <laughs> but um, crazy. But let's get back. Let's get back yeah. to Todd, because this is not a show about Oscar. This is a show about Todd. Um, and um, uh, so let's let's go uh, to your Todd story, because uh, I think your Todd story is great. But first, actually, before you you got into heroin through Jenny and me and Todd. Todd was living at my house then. You remember? Yes. So Todd was living with me, and you and Jenny were getting high, and me and Todd were getting high on dope. Everybody was getting high on dope. And then that's when you and me started writing that script, and we would do coke. And uh, and and Todd and Todd wanted to help write the script, but instead he would just cut lines of coke and do coke with us and stuff. <laughs> he really, he, that's really all he did. He didn't he didn't help with the script much at all. I don't think he wrote any of the script. It was it was it was the chill bug, right? Yes. We're writing the chill bug. Yes, yes. It was a master master work that will never see the light of day. The yeah. chill bug, because either you're chilling or you're bugging out. That was the whole idea of the chill bug. Okay, that's right. Now, that's a, that, that was such a good script. Do you have any idea if uh, if you left first or if Todd left first? I think Todd left first. Um, what do you mean left? Because Todd and Jeremy took off. And uh, and moved to Los Angeles or moved to, you know, they drove across country because they were both getting too addicted to dope. So they left. But I think you stuck around with Jenny for a while afterwards. I, I did. Well, I left and then I came back with Jenny because she was on probation and she had to 
she had to go she had to come back for her probation she couldn't have she shouldn't have left the state but she did and then she freaked out when she was in california so she came back and i me being a dumbass she called me up and i went out there with her we got an apartment and we actually we ended up in brooklyn for a couple months in the summer i have this memory of you being totally dope sick and and getting ready to leave town you know and you came to me to get dope and me being the fucking piece of shit that i was i was like i'll get you dope but you have to get me dope too and um and then uh and i went and i scored us dope and uh and i gave you the dope i gave you the heroin and i remember i sat in your car with you on like bowery and third street or something and we were just like our whole fucking friendship was like basically over uh and yeah. and you were just so fed up well we were both addicted to heroin and uh, awful. and you were I like called, i called my sister i said i don't know what to, well i don't know what to do i'm addicted to heroin and she said you have to call dad and so i called him and i told him and they and he said come home and then i got the heroin from you enough to get me home so i wouldn't be sick and that's when i left that was like 98 i think wasn't it It it's like Uh, 20 years ago shit yeah yeah that sounds right but so it was so was it after that that you moved to california or was before that after that then i chased jenny out to california and then that's where you reconvened with todd that's right. I stayed in, in Alph- it's Alphabet City, right? No, that's Alphabet City's in Manhattan. I don't know. I don't know what's in San Francisco. Maybe there's an Alphabet City in San Francisco. I think there's an Alphabet City in San Francisco, and that's where the, they had a house with like five hippies in it. Yeah, I, Joanna and, and Todd and, and uh, a bunch of hippies. People would squat there, and I ended up squatting there. And eventually, I got the. I, I moved up to Mill Valley, which was closer to Jenny, and I worked for. Uh, for uh, strategic simulations for the video game company, right? Or Orb, yeah. And, uh, and, and I was still scoring heroin out there, you know. Once once I connected with Jenny, she found the black tar, and then me and Todd. Todd was out there, and he was doing PI stuff, and I would hang out with Todd, and we would mix the the black tar into Afrin bottles full of like a little bit of water. So you could just spend it all day just with an Afrin bottle, squirting it up your nose. And I'd spend countless evenings sniffing heroin uh, right outside of Todd's door, outside, just in San Francisco, getting high. <laughs> and I'd drive to Mill Valley, or I'd sleep at his house. Right. Uh, and what was, horrible. what was the, um, <laughs> well. I even like talking about it. Those the fucking the fucking Afrin bottle was such a, an efficient way to do heroin too. Um, it, it was wonderful. I would be on with I'd be on the you know uh, I'd be on the elevator with CEOs and I'd be squirting heroin into my nose. And they'd be like, "Oh, you got a cold?" And they'd be like, "Yeah, you know." The saffron really works wonders. Yeah, I have a constant cold, and it's not going away. <laughs> I need to feed it with my Afrin bottle constantly. So tell tell your Todd um, the Todd uh, private eye story. It's not a very good story. It's, it's, it was a brief moment where we were driving around, and we wanted to get high, and but he was working, so he had this Jeep that his parents had bought him. It was a beautiful Jeep, brand new black. Jeep and Cherokee, great car, amazing it car. Oh, it was beautiful, brand new. And he had all the windows blacked out with, I don't know, some special material that would you could not see into it. Like it just looked like black paint, but you could look out of it. You could see, it's just, you could see clear as vodka. It was, I mean, it was just, Clear as vodka. I think the expression is clear as day. Clear as vodka. You know you're an alcoholic when you say. I thought I'd throw in the 
the you know the drug reference. <laughs> you you know you're an alcoholic when you say clear as vodka instead of clear as day. <laughs> Isn't that what people say? I thought it was clear as vodka. No, anyway. Vodka, dude. Anyway, so so you're in the fucking uh, so so you're in the in the in the jeep. So, so we're doing. He's he's doing his thing. He's videotaping and taking pictures for whatever thing he has to do. And we're sitting in the back, and um, and he, he's got like an eight ball. So we're blowing lines and <laughs> just doing coke in the back of this car. And a cop suddenly shows up around the corner and pulls up like right behind like parks right behind him and we are flipping out and Todd doesn't know so we just freeze and Todd's like he can't see us there's no way he can't see us he doesn't even know we're here just stay still don't move and so we just sat there and we watched the cop and the cop I don't know what the cop is doing but he stayed there for like about 10 minutes just in his car right behind us and we had the blow we couldn't move so the blow was everywhere and the and suddenly the cop just kind of backs up a little bit and pulls away and drives off and that's the story and Todd, so how we got away with it right which was a lot of stories like we're like that. all the stories I we never nothing really bad ever happened well you know bad stuff happened to Todd you know, but he would get away with it too. You know, he would get away with it too, and um, and then you wound up eventually. How did you get out of all of it? How did I get out of the lifestyle? Actually, before we get to that, tell the because uh, Jeremy actually, uh, I, I did. I recorded a quick phone call with Jeremy, and he was telling a story about when him and Todd drove across the country. You know, basically. You know, you and I drove across the country. Him and Todd drove across the country. And then me and Todd drove across the country, I think, a couple times. Me and Todd drove across the country, like, dope sick. You know, like, he had dope and I had methadone. And uh, and it was cold. And he was leaving L.A. because he was done. You know, there was this classic fucking story um, where me and Todd... We're, uh, and we were at the fucking bottom of the barrel, Dave. Uh, the two of us had no money. We had terrible dope habits. Uh, Todd had, like, been arrested and lost everything, had nothing, gotten kicked out of Jeremy's house, I think, was living with me and Jenny, and, um, and fucking, uh, Oh my Had god! You've been crashing your car or something. Didn't you have a car that you kept crashing? Or I crashed multiple cars. Okay. I, I crashed multiple cars, and Todd, Todd had given up his Jeep to buy like a like a fifty thousand dollar Honda or something. Some like it was tricked out. Wasn't yeah, it? some kind of rice burner thing that was like low to the ground. And- yeah, yeah, and then but then he lost that because he couldn't make payments on it. So he wound up buying <laughs> he wound up buying this like used Crown Vic that was like an ex uh, cop car that looked like a Blues Brothers car and um, I wish I could have seen that and uh, and me and him were driving to pick up Jenny and like the car like he was still doing the Afrin bottle thing you know and well, he, uh, never, he would never shoot it right he would only snort it yeah he was too he didn't he was too scared to shoot it and he would always snort it with the Afrin bottle or like in California he always used the Afrin bottle and in New York he always just sniffed it off of CDs did you guys get black tar out in California was it all black tar all black tar yeah um, See, that mixed so nicely in the water; it would just dissolve. But it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, like how the powder would have mixed in the water. Like, That's true. you know, I bet you the powder would have mixed even better. But we just yeah. snorted it like it was lines because it was powder. Uh-huh. I remember the smell. Of oh yeah, baby food or whatever. Yeah, I know. I, I, you know, I can't. I can't escape that that stuff. I mean, I've been clean for. I mean, you've been off heroin for twenty years, and you can still remember the smell. For the rest of my life. So me and Todd were driving across LA, I think on Sunset Boulevard, and like whenever I would smoke a cigarette, I would flick it from the window, you know, like as far as I could. 
And he would be like, dude, you got to stop doing that. And I'd be like, what? Nobody cares. Whatever. You know what I mean? And, um, and I think he's like his, either his license had expired or his insurance had lapsed or he was like driving, not legally, you know? And, uh, and we're driving across Sunset Boulevard and I, and I, and we're high as shit and I flick a cigarette and it hits a cop car. Okay. (laughs) And, uh, and, and the sirens go off. And uh, and they don't see all the dope. We have heroin in the front seat. You know, we have heroin. We have an Afrin bottle. I have pills. Like, there's bud. There's everything, you know. And they don't take any of the drugs, but they took Todd to jail, okay? And to, for? For the driving under a lapsed license or something, you know. Right. You know, I mean, no, no, he, had, he had a fucking warrant. He had a warrant is what it was. He, I don't remember what for, but he had a warrant. So they took him to jail, and he was so angry. He's, I mean, like, if he was alive right now, he'd still be angry at me about this story, you know? And, and I, wound up, I wound up taking all the drugs, you know what I mean? And, um, and then his mother sent me and Jenny the money to bail him out, okay? And um, his mother sent me and Jenny the money to bail him out, and then for years, we like we got the money back. We we used the money to bail them out. We got the money back, and we didn't send it back to her immediately. So, so we like lived. We lived on the money, you know. Of course. And yeah. she got so mad, and he got so mad, and it was this whole thing. And then there was this other time, and this was just such a classic Todd thing. Um, and I've told this story on Dopey, I think. But uh, where me and Todd... I think I probably told all these stories on Dopey. So forgive me, Dopey Nation. But this is DK. You know, what are you I, gonna... love, I love hearing these stories. So, uh, so me and Todd... I, I missed this whole part of your life when you were out in L.A. It wasn't a good part. It was a bad part of my life. I was on methadone. I was a mess. I wasn't working. It was bad. Um, but, um, you were all bad. But... Yeah. Um, anyway... So there was this re- there was this detox that I would go to over and over and over again. Like I just kept going back because you know how I was with using. I-, I would just use. You know what I mean? I like made no apologies about it, and I I just was like I'm gonna use, and I would just use. You know what I mean? Like Todd would right. use a couple days a week, and I would like be like I'm not gonna stop, and uh, until I couldn't. You were full in. Todd, Todd always tried to maintain that he was he wasn't an addict that he had control over it. Right, and I wasn't like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would keep going to this detox, and then finally Todd was like, I'm going to go to the detox, blah, blah, blah. And he goes to the detox, and he decides that the food is so bad that he's not going to stay there. So he's going to leave because the goulash is so disgusting. You know, and fair fair enough, it was really gross, and it really smelled really bad there. It was disgusting. Um <laughs> But he went back to my apartment with Jenny without me. You know what I mean? And uh, and he went back there, and I got home like the next day or two days later or something. You know, and um, and I was still a little bit dope sick. Okay. Right. And um, and I'm, I remember it was me, him, and Jenny were sitting in the living room, and uh, and I'm like, I don't feel good. And he's like, me neither. He's like, let's call him up. You know, he would just say that. Um, let's call him up. He would say that even though we weren't calling anybody. We'd go downtown. But he'd be like, let's yeah. call him up. <laughs> that was like the call sign. Let's call him up. Yeah. He would always be just like, call him up. Anyway. Um, and uh, <laughs> I know. Um, and so he goes. He, so what he does is. He's like, he's like, uh, he's like, Dave, could you, could you pass me my cigarettes? They're in my bag. And I was like, all right. And I open up his bag and there's a fucking paquete of balloons. There's like two paquetes of balloons. There's like 24 balloons in his bag, like full of heroin. Oh my god. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck is this? And he goes, Oh my god, I must have forgotten about them. <laughs> and I was like, You're such a fucking liar. I was like I was like, You didn't forget about them. I know you got them when you left detox. And I was like, But let's do them right now. You know? And, and he was like he was like, um, 
he was like, no, 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 no. I, 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 I did the whole plan. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And eventually he admitted it. Eventually he admitted it. And, um, and years later, um, years later after I had gotten clean and I had a kid and, um, you know, I love Todd, but he was a fucking piece of work. You know, he showed up in Queens with dope, you know what I mean? And I hadn't used and, um, I imagine that that must've been pretty hard if you were trying to go straight and Todd kept showing up. Yeah. Just a walking party. But, but then even before that, before that, he had broken up with a girlfriend of his, right? And he was depressed. And I think I had just started dating Linda, and I was feeling myself. You know what I mean? I was, like, feeling like, like I can do whatever I want, and I have my shit together. And I was living in, like, a free luxury apartment kind of thing. Yeah. And he was like, he was like uh, I was like, you know, I can score whenever I want to, I said to him. And uh, and we didn't have a connect at the time, you know. And he was like, "Oh yeah." He's like, "Well, how would you do it?" And so me and him like went down to Twenty Third Street, like at like five in the morning or something, at a methadone clinic, and you know, and I got us a bunch, and I got us dope immediately, you know. Um, of course. And uh, and we and I did that a couple times just with him challenging me uh, oh that I couldn't do it, you know. And um, that's just how we were, though. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, I had gotten clean, <clears throat> and he kept going. And and the, the places that he wound up going to were like the, the the stories that he had in the end were so depraved. Like he told me a story about like that he was copping dope in Harlem. Uh, in an apartment, and he would smoke crack with this Spanish girl, and um, and he would cop. He would like somehow the Spanish girl trusted him, and like he would steal money from her when she wasn't looking. He would steal money and crack from her, and then and then and then he would like buy dope with the money he stole from her. It was like it was hysterical. As far as I was concerned, it was like the best dopey story, you know. <laughs> Um, I, I'm trying to picture him smoking crack, though. I don't. I don't remember Todd smoking crack. No, he not. In fact, Todd, another funny. I mean, like one of my favorite pieces of Todd's, you know, uh, you know, debaucherous life is that he he loved coke. You know what I mean? Remember how much he, he loved coke? He yes. he loved coke more than anybody. And then, um, but then it started hitting him weird, and like he had this specific cocaine psychosis where he always thought he peed himself and like so he would go out like and Todd wasn't like me Todd would like want to go out and he would go out amongst all these people and he would constantly be touching his crotch to make sure he didn't pee himself I know that's why he stopped doing coke but then he also told me a story and I mentioned it earlier in the episode where he was he was working on dog the bounty hunter and he wound up in Colorado I think looking to score crystal and he wound up scoring a ton of crack and I think that's what got him into crack huh yeah I don't remember the crack thing with Todd so tell tell the Tijuana story yeah so I, I think I don't know if the first time Todd went to Tijuana if he went alone or if he went with Jeremy it sounds like he went with Jeremy because Jeremy alluded to it yeah I think that's I, I remember that because he had gone with and it, I don't know if it was Jeremy but um, he had gone before and it was like you know the holy grail of pills you could go there the pharmacies would just hand you whatever you wanted all you had to do was come with cash and we were like, you know, that's what we're doing. And I'm go- I, I went with him because I just wanted to get pills to eat, and he wanted to sell. And he had a whole plan. I forgot how many hundreds of dollars he had. And I had like 200 or 300 bucks that, we scrounged, that I scrounged together. So we head down to Tijuana. And, you know, it's a beautiful day. We get out, and we're walking around. You can imagine two gringos walking around Tijuana. It's like we should have just had neon signs, you know, over our heads just saying you know the mark is right here bust us yeah bust us you know two idiot 25 year old kids we went to the pharmacy 
got you know then they handed it over like it was candy and uh so we had in, instead of taking what we bought and going back to the jeep and putting it there and then wasting time or whatever i think we were going to waste time because we didn't want to cross the border and then cross immediately again because we thought maybe they would be suspicious of that so like well we're gonna we're gonna hang around and you know let's walk down let's go to a bar so we're walking down the main street i don't know what the name of the street is and uh there's strip clubs everywhere and Taz's like yeah let's go to a strip club and i was like all right you know and we'd eat we'd already i'd already eaten a, a bunch of like i think it was oxycodone uh, or codeine, I forget what it was that I was eating. And so I was getting, we were both really fucked up. And we just found a random strip club and we were like, this one looks good. There's guys outside. They're like, hey, you know, inside, we got the ladies. So we go inside there. Todd, uh, you know, a girl comes up to Todd and, and takes him into a back room. And another uh, girl comes up to me and she takes me into a back room I was so fucked up I couldn't I couldn't get hard or anything and uh, she kept trying to like get me hard it didn't work you know because nothing was working at all I was so high and she kept she kept making fun of me she's like what are you you know what are you gay are you, you know she, I think she kept calling me like a faggot and and I was completely <laughs> insulted yeah. and I, I just felt horrible at that point and it, it felt like, like when we'd gotten there, you know, when things are great and, you know, you're, you're on the mission and then suddenly the dark clouds come over. Right. Like when we walked into the strip club, it was like the dark clouds had formed. Right. And, and I walked out of there. I think Todd got, got blown or something. He, he told me he got, he got blown. <laughs> and, and I was like, all right, you know, and, and I think we sat down to have a beer. I didn't even finish it. I, don't think Todd did either. We were both pretty wasted on the pills. And so we walk out and there's two bouncers and they kept trying to get us to go back in. You know, they oh, spend the money, go go back with the ladies. You know, the ladies want to see you. And we're like, no, you know, we're, we're done. We're, we're taking off, we're going home. And the minute we walked like 10 steps away from that door from those bouncers, I swear the bouncers must like signaled the cops or something because as soon as we were about 10 steps away the cop, the cop car screeched up to a halt right next to us cops jumped out Mexican police and you know put us up against the wall then started patting us down um, you know there's nothing we could really do so they find everything they find all of Todd's pills they find everything that I've got we had weed on us um, but we didn't have any cash we, you know we spent all the cash on the pills so all we had, all I had was credit cards. All Todd has is credit cards. You know, we don't even have debit cards. I don't even know if debit card ATMs were just kind of a thing. Then, you know, it wasn't a big thing to have an ATM card or credit cards with like a PIN number. So we had no access to cash. Right. And they just wanted, so, they just wanted their bribe. They wanted their payoff. They just wanted a bribe. They're $500. You know, the, the two gringos, you got money. You know, you're white boys. You know, you're from America. You got money. They split us up. So the first thing they did is they threw Todd into one cop car and me into another. And then Todd drove off with the cops. And I was sitting in the, in the cop car, freaking out. And they keep asking me for money. And I keep saying, I don't I don't have any money. I kept showing them my wallet. I, I, so I say, Visa, MasterCard, I have no money. No, we go to the ATM. You get money at the ATM. It's like, I can't get money at the ATM. I went up to the ATM. I pushed it in. No, you you know, they thought that I was lying to them. Right. They drove me around all night long to like four in the morning. We stopped two times for, and they picked up two, per, like a drunk and a perpetrator who was trying to like break into somebody's home or something. Right. You know, so I had two, like a drunken Mexican and another one both handcuffed next to me. One was passed out and we're just, and the cops are just torturing me. You know, they're like, they're going to break me. And I think at, at like around 4.30 or 5 in the morning, they were finally like, They think you're going to come with the money. They think that you're going to have the money. No, and that, yeah, and they, they can do this long enough, and finally I'm just going to be like, okay. I got the money. You're fine. I can't take it anymore. Here's the money. Take it. 
<laughs> money. And it, so they finally, I think they finally were just like, you know, they didn't want to deal with me. They've been threatening to throw me in jail, that, you know, I'm going to get raped in the jail. The Tijuana jails are terrible. Right. I mean, all, you know, they're just, and it's all broken English. You know, they don't really speak English that well. So I'm terrified. And they finally run. I think it was like five in the morning. It was you're terrified, but you're not coming up with the money. You know what I mean? You're not like, let me call somebody and I'll get you the money. You're just kind of sitting there. I, yeah, there's, I, I literally had nothing. I mean, I couldn't call my parents. I couldn't get it wired. I, you know, I was, I was thinking, I was thinking I'm just going to, they're just going to throw me in jail. They're going to push it all the way to the end. You know, right. they're going to. They're and then maybe maybe once you're in jail, you can figure out how to get the money. But you're not going to try to get the money until you're doing a night in the Spanish jail, <laughs> in the Mexican jail, whatever. Dave, I couldn't. I Honestly, I don't think I could have gotten the money if I had tried that night. Right. You know, I mean, there's just, there was no way. There was, there was nobody to call. There was nobody, nobody around. You know, we were in Tijuana. The closest people I knew were up in San Francisco or Chicago. Right. And I, I, there, it, it was just an imp- And this is before smartphones, you know, or anything like that. This is all. I just had credit cards, right? And no access to any kind of cash. Nothing in my bank account. And uh, so they finally got sick and tired of it, I think, and realized that I was just a lost cause. So they threw me out on the street, uh, just some somewhere. I couldn't even tell you where I was to this day. It was. It was dark. It was just before dawn, uh, and it was it was a dank street in Tijuana. And all I could think of is one maybe by some miracle, Todd has survived the night and made it back to his jeep. So if I can get back to the jeep, at least that's something I can do. So I start walking. Towards I, the the main street was lighted lit pretty well, so you kind of see the light. So I just kind of started walking towards the light, and um, and I got to the street, and I'm walking, and I got to where the jeep was, and the jeep's gone. Right. So I'm like, okay, either you know they confiscated the jeep, Todd took off, he left me, or hopefully he's I, I, maybe he's around. So I'm like, fuck, all right. So I start just walking. I'm like, my next thought is no Jeep. Okay, I'm going to walk towards the border. You know, you can see the border. So I'm like, okay, I'm just walking to the border. So I start walking towards the border, and all of a sudden I hear horns, and the black Jeep comes skidding up next to me with the the window down, and Todd's going, DK, DK! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God! I run over, I open the door, and I jump in. We're just, like, screaming. Ah! He goes, we're going. I go, 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 go. And I just tear out, you know, with our tails between our legs and get through the border. We didn't have anything on us, so we weren't even worried. We got through the border. Because the cops had taken all the pills. They took everything. Yeah. They took everything they could. That was of worth any value. That's a classic, classic, classic story. And we drove off. Again, unscathed, unhurt. Right. And Just, yeah, with a good story. With a good story. Me and Todd went to, uh, went to Tijuana to get pills uh, shortly after I left rehab and moved to L.A. and started smoking meth with him. And he tried to smuggle... Uh, we smuggled a shitload of pills from Tijuana. And he, like, rather than just, like, putting them in his bag... He went back. He kept going, but we kept going back. He would, like... I think he taped the pills to his crotch. And then as he's going through customs, the bag starts to sweat and starts coming out from his crotch. And he's, like, walking all funny to make sure the fucking bag doesn't come out. You know? Um... <laughs> But um, that's Todd, you know. And Dave, I mean, you got to come back. Completely went back. Oh yeah, we went. I mean, I wanted pills. Like the only reason I did meth was to was to be able to get back to heroin, you know. Um, Right. And uh, and there's one thing about um, you know, about you and Todd. You know, you got off of heroin and uh, and drugs, but you never wanted total recovery, you know. And uh, and Todd fucking hated recovery. He fucking, he just hated it. He just, he couldn't, I mean, you have a life. You have children and a career and a company, and Todd never did, you know? 
he never he never found a, a reason to live you know mm-hmm. and well, um, that, that was yeah my first son really kind of turned a switch in my brain <clears throat> and I don't know if God would have had kids if that was turned a, it doesn't just because you have kids doesn't mean you're gonna stop doing drugs obviously right but, exactly but he didn't yeah he didn't ever seem to get that other reason to live yeah yeah exactly it's something uh, to to strive for which is a, a terrible shame now this episode went way longer than i had intended and it might be the longest dopey episode ever oh, shit. um but i'm gonna read this thing that uh, a friend of mine and a really close friend of todd's wrote um okay you want to hear yeah go it's ahead. this woman named carrie uh she's very close with linda she was very close with todd And she writes, Todd was one of the best friends I have ever had and one of my favorite people on this earth. My heart aches as I write these words in honor of what would have been his 45th birthday. I will always miss him and I will always be sad that he is no longer alive. Since his death, I think my mind has found nearly every memory that I shared with him. Lots of smiles, lots of laughter, and lots of good talks. These memories are precious to me, spanning from my late teens to my 30s. To me, Todd was warm, genuine, open, intuitive, supportive, non-judgmental, and of course, hilarious. For some reason, I always felt it was an honor to know Todd the way I did. To this day, I am sincerely flattered that he wanted to be my friend. The way we laughed and the two seconds of eye contact that could replace conversation were gifts in this life. Every day I pray for him to be peaceful and satisfied, and I ask that he looks after us down here. So that's very beautiful, right? That's very beautiful, yeah. Chokes you up, huh? Yeah, you know, I don't know how well I've dealt with Todd's passing. Well, what do you mean? Um, I... I mean, after I heard the, the, what was it, the American story, what was it? This the, American the, Life. This American Life. That got me pretty hard. And yeah. I think after, when he passed, it, I didn't see Todd a lot at the end. You know, I think the last time I talked to him, he was, he was high. I think I texted him right after, uh, after my ex left, like around 2014 and 2015. I think it was 2015. So I, I didn't really connect with him a lot at the end, and I think that when he when I did hear that he passed, it didn't really hit me until that. This American that, Life piece, right? Yeah, and that that really got me. Right. I, that I felt the, the hurt a little bit more with that. Yeah. I miss Todd. Yeah, I mean, I'll yeah, I miss him too. You want to hear another fucked up email I got? Sure. This is like totally related to this American life. This is actually from uh, an ex-girlfriend of his. You ready? Sure. She says, uh, hi, Dave. Really good to hear back from you. Thank you. I appreciate the reply. Uh, I have to admit. Hold on. No, I'm going to read the first one. Hold on. Um, Hi, Dave. My dear friend and I just connected Todd, his death, you and your podcast. Uh, She can speak from a place of recovery and connect with you from that powerful space. I am reaching out because I have no doubt Todd reached out to me. There is no other explanation for the odd series of events that led to this email. Todd and I were in a relationship a long time ago. Uh, I loved him. We shared lots of ups and downs. Uh, I met you with him in New York. We met in your apartment and shortly after went with you to meet a dealer. I did not know until later that Todd was addicted to anything other than pot or that he had bought heroin back to the hotel with him. We broke up shortly after that trip. I have my own dark predispositions, and I just couldn't. He was the only person... This is a really perfect description of Todd. She said, He was the only person I've ever met that felt like sunshine that got trapped in a human body. His smile, crazy deep blue eyes, raspy voice, and energy seemed unstoppable. And yet, here we are. I am so very sad. Fuck that shit. He was better than this. You know? Uh, And yet, here we are. You were always one of his best friends, and in this mothball, transitory world, that is the only thing that means anything. I felt that from him before meeting you, and I feel it now. 
Um, and then she says some nice stuff about Dopey. And then she says in the second one that fucking she she's driving down the road listening to This American Life. Um it's just, I don't want to read this whole thing. It's long. But she says she was driving down the road listening to This American Life, and Todd talks about ODing, and, or I talk about Todd ODing, and then she hears Todd's voice say, That's me. An unmistakable Rasta raspy voice that she hadn't heard in 16 or 17 years. And then she hit a deer. It's a crazy story. Holy shit. Crazy story. Right. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, and then there's one more I want you to I want to read really quickly. Okay. This is from her friend uh, Morgan. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Oh, here we go. She writes, "Hi, Dave." Uh, it says, I knew Todd. Hi, Dave. I'm sober 12 years. I used to smoke weed and do coke back in 2002 uh, and 2003 and maybe early 2004. I worked at eFilm and used with Todd a ton. He even helped me move after a suicide attempt. I just heard your podcast a few months ago the first time, listened to the clips about Todd, heard on This American Life your whole powerful story, and didn't put it together. I would periodically check Todd's Facebook to see if there were pics of him drinking. I always hoped he'd get sober, but figured if he didn't, it would not end well. I'd cross my fingers, hoping I'd see indications that he'd cleaned up, but obviously he hadn't. Then today, I checked again and learned he died. I'm sad. He saw me in a really, really shitty time. He wrote me on Facebook a few times back in 2010. He was so unapologetically himself in his messages to me. I know exactly what you mean when you talk about him being so disarming, even when he was saying shit no one else would get away with. I really wish the world could have enjoyed a sober Todd. If he was that dynamic loaded out of his mind, I can only imagine what he would have been like sober and working a program. I love your show. I appreciate it. Appreciate your journey, and it's fucking sad when we lose people. I felt like Todd was trying to talk to me today because right as I was listening to Remembering Todd episode and reading my last messages from him and the line in which he talked about Dog the Bounty Hunter, you guys talked about Dog the Bounty Hunter. I also reconnected with my old best friend and Todd's ex, Lisa, who just wrote the other one. Anyway, I just wanted to reach out, say hi. Uh, I'm so grateful to be sober and thank you for the show. Thanks for <clears throat> talking about how being alive is pretty great. I feel the same. I have three kids who have never seen me loaded and a husband I love and the entire foundation of my life, which I don't deserve, is my sobriety. Needless to say, today I got knocked sideways learning about Todd, but I get to remember the people who saw me at my worst, who helped me along the way, and just how lucky I am. So there you go. What do you think? I, it's that's very sweet. I think. Uh, well, what you're witnessing is the power of dopey. That's the yeah, pa- that's the power of dopey right there, Dave. Well, it's incredible. I mean, I, it's incredible how far sweeping you are now. Oh yeah. Especially, I mean, and and that American Life piece was really powerful. I mean, I definitely, you know, I was not clear eyed at when that was over, and hearing Todd's voice. You know, it's very ghostly when when that. Yeah, I know. You do hear him. He's like, "Yo, it's it's fucking incredibly, uh, it's incredibly um, just emotional and uh, <clears throat> and they they produced it in a really a really like emotionally triggering way." But this oh, show, was- this, this this show went way too long. It's just too long. Oh, now, okay. now I want to say that um, it's a joy to have you on the show. Um, and, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm still a little nervous. Why are you nervous? Honest. I don't know because I feel like, like I, like I know there's nobody there right now, and it's just me and you talking. Right. But I feel like the presence of the audience is there. Why don't I ever I feel that? You don't care about anything. Or yeah, it's not that you don't care about. It. You don't care about audiences or people. You think I don't? Around. You think I don't care about people? No, no, no. I don't. I don't. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I think that you have a natural presence in front of an audience, and you know your audience, and you're comfortable speaking to an audience. I've never been comfortable speaking to an audience. Well, I think you've done great. 
And and I want to tell one last story, and I, and we're gonna leave it. I want to leave it with this with this story, which is not a particularly good story, but um, this was my plan for the end of the episode because I want to play this a song at the end of the episode. We're not doing MSG. No, not now. Okay. Uh, um, we're gonna do that next. I mean, like, I want to have you on again, and we'll just do that story. Okay. You know. Um, I, well, yeah, that's, that's a fun story. Yeah, but that's not a Todd story, and this is the Todd no. episode. That's right. Todd's birthday. Um, this is the second Todd episode, really. But who cares? You know, Todd's gone, and, and I love him. And I, I think that uh, I don't think yeah, dope, there, there's no way Dopey would exist without Todd. Um, so doing this uh, an episode that's this long about him is fitting. I mean, honestly, the the the, the fucking architecture of Dopey, the the belief of Dopey, could not have existed without Todd. So. Um, you know, we, we're cool. we're always indebted to him. You know what I mean? It's like, he, you know, he. Oh, I totally do. I, I, <laughs> yeah. He would laugh I, I, at so much at the worst things he did, you know. And uh, and there's so many more stories we could tell. Like when we went to Amsterdam. Oh and, my god. And uh, and me and Todd went to go cop coke, and we wound up copping crystal, and I wound up staying up the whole week. And Todd, <laughs> remember Todd to to smuggle the shit back. You know, like, he's like fucking, he opened up the jelly and then he's cooking the jelly down to smooth the surface so he can put hash in it. And then he sent coffee. What? When we walked into that place and we were sleeping in like a, a closet and then Hillary and, what was it, Hillary and Amy? Or Probably. They came home and they're like, oh, there's a whole, did you guys open up this door? And we opened the door and there's this whole gigantic apartment that we missed. I know. That's my favorite part of the story. <laughs> it's like such a I bit. You know, no, that's just such a bit from a movie. It's so ridiculous. We were so high. Yeah. So, um, so, so the story I want to tell before, before we end the show is, um, me and Todd were in Los Angeles, right? And, um, and we were working on this dumb movie, uh, and, and I don't think you were getting paid. Like, I think Todd was like, fr- it was like Todd's ex-girlfriend and that girl, those, gr- those women who wrote those letters and we weren't getting paid. And, um, and Todd had, had started really smoking a lot of crystal meth and I had sm- started smoking a lot of crystal meth too. And, uh, and after the, the day was over, we got into his Jeep and we sat in the front seat and, uh, and we started smoking crystal meth and uh, and he put on the Grateful Dead, uh, and we bid you good night. Um, and I don't think I had ever heard it before. And uh, and I just sat there in the front seat, and I I made him play it over and over again. And I sat there smoking the crystal meth, listening to the most soulful, sweet song ever. And it was just this sad, weird metaphor. For, for everything with us, you know, like, mm-hmm. like it was just, and I, so I want to, I want to end the show. I want to play, I'm going to play that song at the end. Um, Dave, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. And, uh, and we'll do it again with the, with the Nick story. Cause, uh, it'll be fun. And, uh, and stay strong, dopey nation and fucking toodles for Chris and toodles for Todd. Right? Yeah, toodles. Although Todd was not in- into saying toodles. That would not be something. I can't imagine him saying that. Me neither. And, then, you know, that was Chris's thing. And, you know, um, <laughs> it's weird to have an episode where, like, there's all this grief and no grief over Chris's death. But the two happened so close together for me that it's a miracle that I got through any of it. So, um. I think Todd would say something like, yo, see you later, kid. He would, yeah, he would be, yeah, he would be like, uh, later, you know, <laughs> late, you know, that's what he would always late. say. Um, later, he'd be like, later. <laughs> um, fucking Todd. All right, so stay strong, Dopey Nation, and fucking toodles for Chris, and later for Todd. Lay down, my dear brothers, lay down and take your rest. I want you to lay your head upon your Savior's breast. I love you, oh, but Jesus loves you the best. And I bid you good night, good night.
Good night. And I bid you good night. Good night. Good night. And I bid you good night. Good night. Good walking. Good night. I'm not a good night. Good night. Good night. Is right. I shall come for Good night. Good night. Tell me the all wonderful Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. But I thought I'd stop your cup for me. Good night. Good night. Good night. Lay down, my dear brother. Lay down and take your rest. I want you to lay your head upon your Savior's breast. Loves you the best, and I bid you good night. Good night, good night, and I bid you good night. Good night, good night. Lay down, my dear brothers. Lay down and take your rest. I want you lay. Upon your Savior's breast I love you Oh, but Jesus loves you the best I bid you good night Good night Good night And I bid you good night Good night Good night And I bid you good night Good night, good night. I want to take a walk around the world. I wonder would it do me any good. Until I get some money in my pocket, then I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood. But I want to be good so bad. I want to be so good, so bad, so bad. I want to be good so bad. Bad desire's all I ever had. And I want to take a ride up in the sky. Watch this airplane just pass me by And I want to see a Lear jetliner take a dive Just to show all of these people what it means to be alive But I want to be good so bad Want to be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had And my shadow's getting Smaller, smaller, and it's time to where I stand. Shadows getting smaller and smaller, and it's time to where I stand. And I wonder would they pay it any mind when I leave this busted city far behind? I'll take the high road, however far it winds. Because peace and love are very, very, very hard to find And I want to be good so bad want to be good so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had Damn it, all these suckers make me mad And it's 
all I ever had. And it's all I ever had. And these suckers make me mad, and I want to call my dad, and it's all I ever had. And 